All right, welcome back to Prophecy Cup Season Four. We got some good games today. Today, Vortex against Orn Hub 2.0. Vortex, they were here last season, competing against another name, competing with another name. First day of the regular season, back here today on Prophecy Cup. My name is Flash on the play-by-play. -play, joined alongside Culture on that color cast. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing good, man. I'm ready to see my first dose of competitive play on 8.4. Um, since we didn't get to see it yet in the pro scene. So a lot of stuff untested, but hopefully we'll see these teams pull out some of the, you know, fringe things I've heard around Twitter from experts and analysts, you know, I, the Watcher Jungle and Mid, and we'll see some good games. Yes, we will. So Vortex is going to be starting off on the blue side. Ornhub 2.0 is going to be on the red side. And a bit of things have changed this season. We are on best of three this season. Unlike last uh, few seasons, we were on best of two. So right now, best of three. We have, um, we're not going to be able to have ties this season. So if you get a 1-1, one, one, we will move on to that third game. So it will be quite interesting to see if these teams are able to sweep it up or if we're going to go to three games today. Yeah, and the great thing about best of threes is it gives the team that loses a chance to go back to the drawing board, see what they did wrong, change their pick and bands, or how they went about things in game, and then come back and hopefully tie it up. And also just for in the season record reasons, best of twos, it can be really complicated with the ties and everything, but we're about to go into pick and bands right now. Let's see what uh, Vortex, or is that Vortex? That is no. Vortex on the blue side, and it yeah. is Ornhub 2.0 on the red side. Yeah, let's see what they ban out first. Ornhub is known for a lot of... Well, there you go, the Nidalee play. Over it, he does like to play these early aggressive junglers. He played a lot of Ringar and Kha'Zix in the play-ins. Uh, we'll maybe see a lot of AD carry bans going Astris way. Astris being at the top of three different categories, two different categories in the play-ins in highest KDA um, and highest, I believe, DPM or damage in the play-ins. But we do see the Camille ban coming out and then a Rise ban as well. Trying to hit Hamlet a little bit in the mid lane. Getting rid of these AP champions early. Trying to get rid of these champions. Vortex was here last season under Royal Era. I believe they have changed up some players. I think their, their mid and AD look a bit different. Rexalis did play last split, so... Similar team, but they have rounded out their composite their team with uh, some new players So let's see if they are able to just throw their team together and push it forward while Orn hub 2.0 they have competed in uh, With under there have been other Orn hubs, but this is 2.0. So they are different They did go through the play-ins So they are here and ready to stay for season 4 trying to pick up the win and you see some of these expected bands like the Skarner, which has shown up so much in pro play because of, yes, it takes him a while to scale up in the early game. He has to get to level six before he can really do much of anything. But once he does, that instant initiation is so scary, especially to your back line. If you can't stop him, especially with unsealed spellbook, he just gets to your back line, pulls your AD carry or your mid laner into the rest of his team, and they're immediately dead. You see the Scion picked. He is S tier on this patch just because... He can get through lane without much trouble, and then he has such great initiation potential, plus the second life coming back from glory after death being so, so powerful in team fights And just even in lane, and you see the Gangplank, a Scanlan champion, did get take a few hits in the recent patch. They did try and nerf his Q a little bit, so he didn't have such an easy time in lane, but he is still very good in the top lane. Just able to scale, and we all know what a Gangplank late game can do. And you see the Braum coming out. Braum, one of Jose Fume's favorite champions in planes he played them twice had a 5.67 kda and 100 percent win rate in the two games he played it on we'll see what uh what vortex answers back where they can go ahead and try and lock in their bot lane or at least take the tristana away from asterisk early it looks like that's what they'll do um i expect maybe they lock in their bottom lane right here you see the alistar um since you already know the brahms coming out it doesn't really matter what AD carry they take. Tristan's one of those general AD carries, S tier, that can really be played into anything. And then we'll probably see them try and target some bands toward the AD carry position if you don't see uh, if you don't see Ornhub take an AD carry with their last pick. 
Yeah, and Tristana is, like you said, a really good pick right now. That late game is super strong. Play that Tristana now, because I did hear that it will be nerfed soon. I right. believe. So, just this Tristana. Yeah. <laughs> Play it until it gets nerfed. But it uh, looks like Talia is going to be hovered around. Both top lanes are locked in. That is going to be Scion and Gangplank. And it looks like it is going to be a Talia lock in right here. So Talia probably going to go into the mid lane. We have finished the first round of our draft phase, going into the second round of our banning phase. So on uh, Vortex, they haven't really picked up a mid laner or a jungler yet. So let's see if they are going to ban out those champions. And now I expect for Ornhub to go ahead and hit that mid lane hard. They already got Hamlet, his favorite pick, the Talia. He did. He had a 5.4 KDA with his Talia, was, had 21 kills in the mid lane they like to bounce this figure just because of how much zone control he has in the mid lane how safe he can play with a new ap itemization he has such good cooldown early he can just sit back and scale up um we already see another 80 carry ban coming out from varus as expected but i mean to give away this to leah it kind of says that vortex didn't do their homework but at the same time it's the first game of the season, so they can afford to experiment with things, especially with best of three. You can allow things like that through. We see the Orianna band coming through as well. These utility mages are coming back into play in competitive, mainly because they can synergize well with Eye of the Watcher. I mentioned it briefly before we got into it, but Eye of the Watcher, especially mainly the Spell Thief's edge line, is coming into the mid lane because it makes up for the vision lost by Tracker's Knife being able to cover your mid laner, keep your own lane safe, and it still gives you the gold gen cooldown reduction and the uh, ability power that doesn't divert too much from your original build. You see the last AD carry ban, Zaya going away, and now will be Astris running through his picks. He has a lot of them. He might lock in the vein. He did really, really well on it in the plans. We'll see if he locks in here with 10 seconds left to go. Caitlyn would also be a good pick hovering around that one. Does go back to the vein like you said? Gonna see if they can lock this one in. It looks like it is gonna be a vein lock in, so the bottom lanes are gonna be picked up. Astris and Jose Fumi are gonna be going with the vein and Brom bottom lane against the Tristana Alistar. So both lanes actually pretty aggressive. Alistar obviously more aggressive than the Brom, but I mean, potentially watch for a lot of fighting in that bottom lane. Yeah, this Brom, he will, Brom will have the lane advantage on level one. Uh, two, three, mainly just because of concussive blows from his Winter's Bite. It's very easy to win a level one or level two all in with that passive. However, once Alistar gets to level, even level two, he can easily do a, a headbutt pulverized or do another variation of the combo to basically all in and with Tristana at his side, completely take this Vayne low. Tristana does win the range battle against Vayne early and while it is Astris's best champ, his favorite champion, if Loker and Kurama, I mean, if Sh uh, Shade and Frood and Man Walrus can get Whoa. on top of this vein early and take them low and just win lane, it'll be very hard for Astris to come back. But you say, whoa, because you see the Nunu locked in. He has risen into the S to A tier in the jungle just because he has so much control of the jungle early. He won't be your, you know, your regular skirmisher. But in a game where vision control is no longer a big part of the jungle with Tracker's Knife gone, he can do early invades and just ravage the enemy jungle. But at the same time, Shivana can do the same thing. She's locked in for overrate. Again, this aggressive mentality coming in from Ornhub 2.0. And it'll basically be who can invade better between Lulker and overrate. Yeah, and Nunu Azir, that's, that's the combo a lot of other people have been talking about. See, see if they can chain up their CC. Watch for Nunu to possibly be going in and trying to steal out these camps like you were saying. But both teams have locked in their picks. 30 more seconds until they try to start the game and we get our 3 minute delay. But Vortex against Ornhub 2.0. First game of Season 4 coming up. Picks have locked in and Culture. Just looking at the compositions. Who do you give this one to? My initial instincts are to give this to Ornhub just because they have so many comfort picks. They were given the Gangplank, which Pokemon A played three games of that in the play-ins, the Talia Hamlet's favorite pick, and then the Vayne Braum is such a potent lane if played right, and you can bet your bottom dollar that Astris and Jose Fuma are going to play it right because these are their most comfortable champs. But at the same time, if Vortex can get to that mid-late game where Tristana and Azir scales, and remember, Nunu not only is a good invader, but he also applies that 40% AP buff to Azir to nearby allied champions, 
So they can get to this late game. They have so much potential to have a huge front line with Sion, Nunu, and Alistar and just allow Azir and Tristana to poke in the back. However, that requires them to wait out Ornhub, and Ornhub proved in play-ins they don't like doing that. I watched some of their VODs of their first game when over it was on Ringar, and it's rare to see them with no lanes pushed in, even in a lane where they shouldn't be winning. It's rare to see them that where they don't have lanes fully pushed in, which allows Overrate to invade aggressively, get early advantages, and possibly find early kills. So Loker has to be careful because Overrate will be gunning for him in these 1v1s that Shivana obviously wins against Nunu. Yes. Pretty interesting to see who's going to come out of this one ahead right now. 1 minute 40 until that spectator delay is over, but excited to get into the first game of Prophecy Cup. The season four starts. See oh, yeah. if uh, see if they can actually push themselves up and bring themselves because a lot of people in this early stages in the early stages of the the league, I mean, they either don't try hard enough or they ha they kind of come in with some misprepared stats, reading out how they are gonna play the game. But I mean, coming into this game, hopefully both teams have read each other. They've looked at each other's play-ins. Hopefully they can see who will play what and try to study each other's play style i mean and that's another intangible factor is vortex has been in the league they were back from season three same team they didn't have to go through the plans just under a different name although they did switch out a couple positions so they don't really have to think oh this is our first time Ornhub, this is their first time actually in the group stage of prophecy cup for three months they have tried to find a way in and they couldn't do it through the plans until now. So they have a whole bunch of nerves most likely coming in this game and not a whole lot of game film to prepare off of. Even I tried to find a film of Vortex and I couldn't really find anything. So for Ornhub, they just have to go off of OP.GG and whatever scraps of uh, preparation they could find. While for Vortex, they had the plans to have looked at uh, Ornhub's game style and how they play, how Overrate likes to start his jungle, what champions they like to play. And yeah, they might have given up a whole bunch of comfort picks, but they might also know exactly a strategy to play into this. Azir does do well into Talia. Tristana does do well into Vayne. And Sion can lane comfortably against Gangplank as long as he gets a little bit of help from Nunu, which should come in the form of uh, deeper vision and a lot of top lane priority. So, you know, Ornhub, they have the advantage when you look at it on paper, but there are a lot of intangibles that could lead to Vortex taking this series quite possibly like you said we are on to the loading screen right here first game of prophecy cup season four is about to get underway and i'm excited culture's given his opinion to see who's gonna potentially come out ahead both these teams not really knowing exactly what each other's play style is going to be vortex was in here last season but they have Put in some new players, so a big mystery, as you said, right here. Yeah, I mean, and just the excitement of starting a new season can get to anybody, you know. I mean, new season possibilities, the potential to win Prophecy Cup is a big deal. And, I mean, changing formats means different teams on top. When you go from best of twos to you know, best of the ones or best twos, even best of three, that can open up new opportunities for teams to rise above because there are some teams who are better at best of ones, some who are better at best of twos, being able to come back and salvage a series, or just, you know, teams that are better at coming back and reacting to what they've seen on the rift in game one and coming up with a new strategy in best of threes. So this will be our first chance to see which of these teams get better at that and then which of these teams can get better at it and grow over as the season continues. That's another big thing that best of threes are popular for is it gives teams a lot of room for growth because you just play more games. So I mean, I'm excited to see how this season develops and how it evolves as we continue through this uh, seven week process. That is, that is true. I mean, Hey, you know, uh, I think a big team that a lot of people know that have seeded in best of threes and not as much in best of one is like tsm right when they oh had God. best of threes they were they were losing their first game but they come <laughs> back in the last two and start winning so they read their team in that first game and then afterwards they do they do better so best of ones they haven't done as well so 
Best of twos is kind of like that middle ground between that best of one, best of three. Yes, if you know you might not win the best of three series, you can cheese one game out and then just lose the next one. Right. But yeah. with best of threes now, it's you don't have much room to hide, you know? it's The better team really does win best of threes. True, right. And that's, I mean, that's a classic, you know, observation in best of threes is, you know, the good teams, you know, the quote-unquote strong teams are good at best of ones being able to just roll over opponents we saw it uh a few years ago when not nah, is that yeah a few years ago now goodness gracious i'm getting old when we saw fanatic roll through europe 18 and 0 and imt roll through or was it imt or no imt rolled through with best of three <laughs> but no when we saw fanatic roll through best of ones 18 and 0 um but now it's a whole different ball game, and the best teams know how to play best of threes, but now we're on the rift, seeing some early action. Seeing some early action, like you said, best of ones and best of threes, they are quite different, but Prophecy Cup. You know what? Is that like the best of both worlds? You start off with the best of two, and then you move on, you go to the best of three. You're going to see it all, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's easier to adjust from best of two to best of three than it is to adjust from best of one to best of three. It's a completely yeah. different culture shock, so... I mean, they're probably grateful for that, being like, hey, it's just one extra game. But any adjustment, I mean, for some teams, that could be the, the end of the world, you know? It just depends on who you are and what your mental fortitude is. I've seen a lot of pings going down. My ears are bleeding right now. Come on, guys. Yeah, <laughs> they've been pinging a lot, but both teams actually started out in a very standard line. Looks like Loker's just going to start off on that red buff on the bottom side of the map, getting... Getting a leash from Man Walrus, and uh, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that name. How do you pronounce that culture? Uh, Shadenfrood, I believe. Shadenfrood? Alright. Shadenfrood or Freud? We'll go with that. Like that. We'll just call him Freud. You know. Oh, this might that. be a bit of danger right here. Man Walrus is gonna get two stacks of the concussive blows on him. And that trade right there just gave them temporary lane control. Actually, all these trades going through all the lanes with Rick Salas actually taking some early lane control away from his counterpoint in Pokemon. A. But that just gives Asterisk and Jose Fumi a little bit of the cushion they need early in this lane to try and get this vein to a comfortable spot because uh, now things are kind of even. However, Shaden Fruit, you know, Manwal was just using those two Relic Shield stacks to get him back to full health. So the advantage didn't last that long. But I'm looking at the jungle because we didn't see any true early invades from either of these junglers we did see Ornhub put down some early wards to try to try and you know counter the new new invade but he didn't even try it he went straight to his blue he's gonna look to invade now however probably go for the raptors after skull crab or the krugs which is kind of standard of the early invade coming in from a new new yeah, and also another big thing to note is when uh, Jose Fumi and Estris just stood in that tri brush. It gives a lot of vision for the Nunu to be able to invade, knowing that Shivana did start on the top side rather than the bottom side. But looking like there is going to be a team fight. Karama might be in a bit of trouble. That's going to be first blood going on to overrate. And it looks like the next target is going to be Loker as well. He has to flash out of that one. He has double buffs as well. Overrate has double buffs. Takes a tower shot and a nice snowball to the face. One kill going on to the side of overrate. And if you're the side of Ornhub 2.0, that's exactly what you want to do. Get Hamlet Whoa! ahead. Oh Flash my God. onto the other side. Loker is in a bit of trouble right there. Overrate getting two kills in the early game, putting his team ahead right here. And that's that early aggression that I told that you know we talked about during pregame. Overrated, always looking for that early advantage jungle, looking to get those early kills. He finds it on a counter gank in the mid lane where Azir was just positioned poorly, taking a little bit too much minion aggro from the mid lane where Telia got into the bush, so she stopped taking some. And then that early Shivana damage from the twin bite, even though they nerfed the AD ratio, it still hurts this early in the game, especially with red buff on it, getting the early kill, and just being extremely aggressive even more as Pokemon has the Wasted Flash there. And getting that kill on Loker, where you wouldn't see a lot of junglers trying to do that. They just let Loker back and take the early jungle farm and vision. He said, no, I want this kill. I want these two, this this gold advantage in the jungle. But Loker now is in a bit of a tough spot as Overrate has two kills on his belt. Both junglers not really uh, succeeding each other in the CS differential. 20 to 21 right here. But... Just on the top side, I mean, just that gangplank burning that flash. 
is really big for Rexalis. Oh yeah, he had to burn Flash and had to burn TP to come back to lane. That gives Rexalis uh, the ability. If if Nunu wanted to try, if Loker wanted to try and come and try and a uh, gank on the gangplank if Pokemon push too far up, then it's possible. But I don't think he would do that. I feel like Pokemon is smart enough not to get caught out by such a gank. But it does open up the ability for a global play since Rexalis does have TP advantage. They can go for this dragon. Uh, go for a dragon fight in confidence, but they don't have vision on it and Shivana just so good at taking these early drakes Gonna go ahead and get this infernal drake over to orn hub 2.0 Which will just accelerate the pace of the scaling of this vein and this Talia exponentially this early in the game And that infernal drake is gonna push them ahead 2 and 0 oh, and now an infernal drake right here uh, Orn hub 2.0 put looking like they're in a really good spot Rixala's also burning a TP for Pokemane, and it looks like Loker right here is going to be running around in his jungle trying to get something out. And just a 1k gold lead five minutes into this game. Ornhub 2.0 in, in a really good position, and uh, basically you can't ask for a better start than that. And you have to think about how much this gold, where is this gold located? It's located onto the Shivana, which is so huge because on champions like Nunu, Shivana, and even like Nidalee, your main job, you look stronger when you put your opponent behind. And now this Nunu is behind, this Shivana looks so much stronger. She has that early game advantage. You already see she's looking for the Skull of Crab to possibly look for an invade. And if you're Pokemon, yeah, you're losing to Rexalus early, but he's on a gangplank of Pokemon. Oh, actually, we see Oh, no, that looks like that's going to be the Unstoppable Onslaught and also the Cannon Barrage as well. Rexalus is going to pick up a kill. Overrate is going to try to go in Loker. Might be in a bit of trouble right here. Overrate is going to be trying his best to get this kill. Killing Spree is going to go on to Overrate right there. That's going to be 3 and 0. Oh, so overall, a 1 for 1 in the top lane. It looks like Hamlet and Karama might be having a little bit of fight. They're just going to back off and go back to their lanes. And... That was a classic case of Loker, Loker using that Blast Cone to find a favorable gank on top of Pokemane and just not respecting the unstoppable onslaught coming in from the Scion. However, the kill still goes on to the Shivana, which just accelerates her that much quicker. She already has her Blood Razor, already has a Control Ward, ready to go in and continue invading onto this Nunu, and there's nothing that he can do about it. And if you're Gangplank, one death is fine because the goal that you're missing from lane, you're making up from your passive. So this Gangplank can continue to sit and farm in lane and still be effective in the mid to late game. Ornhub is still looking mighty fine in this early game. While if you're the side of Vortex, you have to find some early advantage. And we see Talia coming in for a gank oh. right now. Coming in for a gank. That's going to be the Weaver's Wall. going to be used. Shaded Fruit might be in a bit of trouble right there. That's going to be an Ignite on him. Ash is going to pick up that kill as well. Concussive Blows is finally going to land and stand up, uh, stun up onto Man, Man Walrus. Gets hit up while Astros is taking up a lot of damage from the tower shot. Hamlet and Astros might be in a bit of trouble. Where is the snowball going to come in? A few more seconds until the flash is going to be up. Flash snowball, flash snowball, and Jose Fumi gets out of there alive with W on the Braum. And a shakily performed dive after a perfectly performed gank almost leads Ornhub to demise. They almost lose all three and lose a three for one trade, but somehow. They get all three members out and still have overrate to cover the mid lane. And if you're Vortex, you have to be looking out for that. You're behind in all your lanes. All your lanes are pushed up. And that's exactly the type of game Ornhub likes to play. They love to play aggressive, pushing all their lanes. And with a Talia, that's exactly the gank they're going to pull when you go to the bottom lane. Just easy level six gank. Get a kill. Get this vein an advantage. Now she has a kill. And now all three of your lanes are sitting pretty right now. And... If you're Vortex, you have to find some sort of advantage. Maybe find some deep jungle wards so you can keep track of the Shivana. Find a dive onto this gangplank in the top lane. Find something, because right now you're falling behind extremely early when you can't afford to, while Ornhub is just accelerating their game and their power spikes exponentially. That is... Looks like this is going to be a fight going in in the bottom lane. That's going to be the rocket jump to try to go into this one. Jose Fumi does have the E up to try to stop some damage, but Loker can't really do much right here. And it looks like Overrate is going to be coming back. Here's going to be Teleport coming in from Rexalis as well. Look at Ham Hamlet from the come side. Look at Hamlet from the other side. This is going to be a big fight as well. Manrol is jumping into home and save Fumi. They're all colliding in. Here's the Cannon Barrage coming in from Pokemane as well. Hamlet coming to try to in, try to come and do some more damage while Rexalis just backs off of that one. Karama and 
Kurama might be in a bit of trouble here. Overrate looks like he's going to be trying to go in. Rexalis does stop him out, but he gets hit up and knocked away by the vein right there. Rexalis gets taken down, and he's in here with his last life. As Rexalis tries to put more damage down, but they do want to try to go on to Kurama. That's a nice knockup as well. And Ornhub 2.0 are putting down the damage on the Vortex. And I, this is why Hamlet loves this pick. You just see the mechanical prowess on this guy. He has so much time put on this Talia, and it shows. Now, in that fight, you could have seen how Vortex might have won that, but the engage is uncoordinated. You saw Manwalwars go in first, but no real follow-up. I mean, and how can he? Nunu can't really follow up except with a Flash Ultimate, which he was late to do, until the rest of Ornhub showed up to the fight. And while they were able to trade one back, it was the support. And then Rexal is trying to cover the escape of Kurama, gets caught by the vein by the Talia, and then even that wasn't even worth it as his mid laner still falls he said i sacrificed my life for you gotta get away man and so now it's an eight to two lead the goal lead has expanded to 3.6 and i mean it's looking more and more dire for the side of vortex in this early game and it is going to be hard for vortex to be coming back from this one over eight being four zero and two Putting that Shivana every part of in every part of the map, just putting advantages in basically every single lane. Two zero and three for both Hamlet and Astris right here. Putting themselves in a lead and they're just doing super well. 4k gold lead in 11 minutes with an infernal dragon. And it does look like they do want to go for another dragon at is as it is up. So quite possibly they might be having another dragon fight. Loker maybe might want to steal this, but Astros does want to look like they want to go in for a fight. Here's the rocket jump trying to go in. Shaded Fruit is going in hard, and that's going to be the head by Pulverize on a Jose Fumi as well. Absolute Zero is going to be on the backside trying to do some damage. It looks like Loker is going to get knocked up by Hamlet right here. Manuel Wallace has to use the ulti to try to escape from this one. Here comes Overrate to try to go for more. Loker is going to get taken down. Manuel Wallace as well might get taken down. Hamlet doesn't really pick up the kill, but Manuel Wallace actually lives with a sliver of HP right there, and another kill going onto the side of Ornhub 2.0. And you see Vortex trying to make something happen. However, they just don't have the same mobility as the side of Ornhub, and it looks like Ornhub might look for more. Trying Glacial to find Fissure is gonna land. And Ooh, again, God. another two kills going into the side of Ornhub 2.0. They are ramping up and just destroying them at this point. And this is the power that we saw in the play-ins from Ornhub 2.0. This is the roster that got them into group stage. And you can see it's well-deserved. This early aggression, the only lane that couldn't play aggressive was a top lane, and he's fine with that. And you see Vortex trying to make plays, but Ornhub has too much mobility. You see the Shivana able to just speed her way down to the bottom lane, Talia as well. And Kurama, he just can't respond as quickly as Hamlet can to these engages to these team fights he, he finally gets down there but even when he does even when he does find his way to the fight he doesn't do enough damage at this point sitting only on a stinger and on a fiendish codex to actually have an impact on the fight and you know they if you're vortex all you can do right now is just try and find a way to stall out trying to find a way to slow down the snowball that orn have us put themselves into and allow tristan and azir to catch back up into this game and if you can get it to a 30 40 minute game you might have a chance but right now it's just looking to all orn hub 2.0 i mean at this point do you think it'd be better just to like stall it out or just accept that you made the mistake in this game and just trying to move on to the next one um i mean yes it's best of three so yes you do have another opportunity to tie the series and come back but at the same time it's just never a good look to try and, you know, give up on a game. And, and they have the tools to find a way to come back. They just have to find that coordination right now and find the points where Ornhub is weakest as we do have a pause coming in. And while Ornhub doesn't look weak right now, their big weak spot is this top lane. If they pick on Pokimane a little bit more, try and find some full dives onto this Gangplank. Uh, actually, he's in the bomb lane now. If they can prevent this coming tower dive which i believe that orn hub it might possibly go for right now they are moving the map in that direction and then find a way to give this sign some help put this game plank behind and use him to get free gold to get your other lanes back in the game and stall out the game as long as you possibly can and then just contest towers azir is per really really good at stalling out games now we do have to remember that baron buff and elder drake buff are now made for accelerating games past the first initial barren take. So 
you still have to worry about not preventing, not giving up second and third barons. But if you can do that, I still see a way for Vortex to get back into this game. It just involves them finding advantages for Azir and Tristana. That is true, Tristana. If have some, if given some kills, could possibly just tread until the later stage of the game. It's only 13 minutes into this game, but it actually does feel pretty long. 13 kills, 13 minutes, basically a kill per minute. So it is going to be grim for Vortex to really come back from this one, but it is possible, like you said, just try to put some uh, resources back into the Tristana, try to put some resources back into the Azir as well. Because Azir is not just down in... Uh, kills but down in cs as well to hamlet's um talia so that's gonna be a hard uh thing to come back from but right now it looks like one hub 2.0 are trying to put some pressure into this top lane as they have rotated up the top and the bottom sides yeah and the, the next key to stalling out is also getting good vision control you saw they were able to predict and send numbers up to that top lane turret to prevent it from going down because they had good vision on it and we're actually seeing Ooh. hamlet taking karama down low Super low, actually. Karama escapes. Just a bit of HP right there, but Hamlet just being able to bully out Karama is such a big deal because you lose so much wave control and you could potentially lose this, this tower as well as Karama does try to go back, but Hamlet picks up another kill right there for himself. And that's just greedy backing. You can't back there. You know you're low health. You know this Talia. He's going to try and shove in the wave and then look for a kill if he can. And now you see a flash from Jose Fume. Cannon Barrage is going to be landed out from Pokemon as well. Look, that's going to be the Glacial Fissure. Hamlet's going to be unstoppable right there. Man Walrus is going to be the next target. Has to use the flash to try to get out of there. But the damage is coming down really strong from Hamlet right there. Double kill going up for Hamlet. And uh, Team Ornhub 2.0 with the Rift Herald are pushing their lead. Gonna put that Rift Herald down on the top side as they are just decisively winning in every stage of this game right now. And this is the type of play that you like to see from uh, a new team in the Prophecy Cup. They are playing aggressively. They have great coordination, just great synergy. That play came together in literally a nanosecond. A TP came through, a Talia wall as well, and there was no hesitation from Jose Fumi coming in to try with that, that flash into the into the ultimate. And it was just beautiful to watch. And if you're the side of Vortex, you know, now is the time when you need to start thinking, okay, we need to start looking ahead because obviously their power spikes are so big. I mean, look at this, over eight is oh. challenging a 2v1 by himself on their tower and not even flinching and missing the ulti as well right there yeah and if you're the side of vortex it's where you need to look forward maybe think about either we ban hamlet's tilia because he's so comfortable on it and it's just the global pressure is too much for us to handle when we try and perform ganks or you try and pick a mid laner who is a counter to this tilia you know, either you ban it, don't give away so many comfort picks, or you try and counter it in your pick and ban, and then try and come in and understand how aggressively they will play and try and counter that as well. It's well, over kind of simple one, two, three. Might be caught up. That is going to be the unstoppable onslaught on as well. Smite down as well. That's going to be the ultimate coming down from overrate. Will they be able to try to pick something up? Overrate. Is he going to get taken down right here? He's about a quarter HP, a little less. Man Walrus is going to try his best to put some CC down. That's going to be Pokemane getting a kill onto Loker as well. And Overraid lives with his life. Pokemane trying to go onto Rexalus right there. New auto task coming in. He's going to dance it out as he gets taken down on the side of... Right there, Hamlet trying to go in for more. Shade and Fruit might be in a bit of trouble. That's going to be a lot of damage going inside. Hamlet doesn't even care about this tower. Going to try to go in. Buster Shot's going to take out Ooh. Hamlet. Shut down going right there. Nice Buster Shot coming in from Shade and Fruit. A great, uh, great mechanical play coming in from, coming in from, um, Shade and Fruit. Uh, to, you know, try and bait Hamlet and then Buster Shot him away to secure that kill, but... At the same time, you finally get to see Pokimane getting into some of the action. That should get him his Trinity Force. It will get him his Trinity Force as well. So now he's fully kitted out and ready to split push. And now you'll probably just see Ornhub, if they don't want to just continue to group up and snowball these leads, just go to a 1-3-1 and use their mobility to just pull Vortex apart. You know, you have the mobility to, if a member gets ganged up on, send Talia up there, send a Teleport as well, uh, Overrate. 
using his his W can get to any lane extremely quickly, especially with a Cloud Drake on top of that. And they're fully kitted out with region as well from this Ocean Drake. They're in a good spot to just execute the plan ABC. And as long as they don't divert from that plan and don't feed over kills being greedy, they should be fine as Rexalis, uh, bro, yeah, you Yeah, Rexalis uses the unstoppable onslaught to try to escape. He does. <laughs> but I mean, just has a lot of damage coming up from Hamlet, 8, 1, and 6 currently. Yeah, I mean, rocks can do many things, but unfortunately they can't stop a freight train, so... No. Uh, well, you can't Maybe do you throw there. more rocks at them and it'll work. <laughs> you throw enough rocks, you hit the train's engine, and then it eventually over and stops. And then maybe you can kill the gigantic transformer that's going to start running at you and roaring. And or you just throw it on the tracks and hopefully it flips over, right? That too. I mean, that, hey. Quite possible. We've seen weirder things in Michael Bay movies, so... Oh. You know. Have we seen bigger comebacks than this game? <laughs> no. Mm-mm. Uh, no, well, you know Optimus Prime can do anything, but this isn't trans this isn't Optimus Prime in, in uh, Transformers. There is no what's his name. Uh, what's his name? What's the name of that actor that took over after Shia LaBeouf went a little bit too crazy from the to take anything out of it? Uh, um, I have no clue. I'm sorry. Mark, Mark <laughs> Wahlberg. There we go. Mark Wahlberg. It shows how much of a movie nerd I am. There's no Mark Wahlberg here. It's just uh, a very angry Talia who's extremely fed and wants to kill you. So, but getting back toward the game, we do see Talia pushing the bottom lane in. There's not much this Sean can do. We see Gangplank. There's not much this Sion can do against Gangplank either. And you see the three in the mid lane. And right now, Vortex is just counting down the death clock. They're trying to stall out, but there might not be a lot of hope for them. I, you know, It'll take one more good team fight to just completely turn this game over the top to where it's out of reach, and he might as well call it GG. Well played. Well, the one through one's coming out like you said, putting down a lot of pressure. Overrate and friends are gonna just take down this Baron and uh, potentially lead their put their lead even more ahead as they are just. Decisively 12k gold right now ahead and uh, looks like the cannon barrage is gonna get down and Karama just gets deleted Absolute zero really gonna do nothing as uh, Astros gets stunned up by the vein right there Man walrus as well gonna be the next target and just Warnhub 2.0 21 kills to 3 right now 42k gold lead to 28 just an insane showing on this first day of prophecy cup season 4 and it looks like they are gonna be one of those teams that people are gonna have to try to stop going into the season. Yeah, and I like just look at that. Just so like they don't they don't even worry about the Baron, which they could have taken even if they got challenged by the Nunu. They immediately, as soon as Vortex turns and walks on vision, they immediately turn around. Talia rotates to the mid lane, and then they find three kills, take it. You know, it's just smart play, realizing hey. We don't need to burn down this Baron. We can go get three kills and secure this Baron easily and not leave the chance open for a dramatic miracle steal from Nunu. And now you see the Talia 10, 1, and 6. Hamlet building that Oblivion Orb, one of the new items we see in the game that builds in Merlin Omicron. But right now, he's just getting it for the flat magic penetration and the extra health and AP that it brings. So that's going to bring him even more power on top of the Rylai's, the Haunting Guys, and the GLP that he has so and for those of you that don't know it's not magic pin on magic pin anymore the haunting guys now does basically ramp up damage which is you know two percent over it builds two percent every second over basically ten seconds because you can only get about or five seconds you can only get ten percent at the highest stack um and so you know you can be dealing the 15 magic pin plus the ten percent extra magic damage on top of that in team fights which is just crazy to think about since Leah all she does is just oh like, that is so oh, much God. damage cannon barrage is gonna come out loker might be in a bit of trouble that's gonna be the flash kill the emperor's divide is gonna come up from karama as well that's gonna be astris as unstoppable and it looks like right here vort or ornhub 2.0 are pushing their lead to crazy charges i mean just on the bottom lane, going to get down this inhibitor. On the mid lane, going to take down that tower and potentially that inhibitor as well. Looking at the top lane, that's going to be another tower as well. They are just destroying their base and cleaning them out. Weaver's wall going to come out. Rexalis not going to 
be able to escape this one. Looks like he actually does. That's gonna be the glacial fissure on the last tip to knock him up. Man Walrus might be in a bit of trouble here, but he does escape a bit, and that is gonna be three inhibitors on the side of Ornhub 2.0. And I mean, Shoden for he's trying to do everything he can, poking in the back line, but this is your son that only has her static ship. Mammal was back in. But might want to go back in right there. Hamlet is just going to be taken down a bit low, so they have lived a little longer. Maybe the next wave push after they go back will be the ending decisive one, but Man Rollers looks like he might want to go on the chase, but he backs up at the end of the day. Three second backs with the Baron Empowered Recall right here, and it looks like Ornhub 2.0 are stamping their name on this first game. Exactly, and Ornhub playing it smart, realizing they can continue to be aggressive, take those inhibitors that, honestly, outside of using those few members as self-sacrifices, human sacrifices, Vortex can't really defend them. And they are able to stall out a little bit, but not not very long. And then they're going to take this Ocean Drake. And now Overrate should have enough to finish this Titanic Hydra. You see the Gangplank bought an extra BF sword. So all the members of o Ornhub just re-upping, getting new items, getting ready for this last final push, taking their jungle camps, just starving Vortex out, saying, this is our map. Hey, Prophecy Cup, we're Ornhub 2.0. We've been trying to meet you for three months. Now we're finally get to shake your hand, and we're just gonna take you and like Ronda Rousey instead of shaking your hand, just slam you and break you, break a table with your back. It's like a, it's like a Donald Trump handshake where he just grabs you, right? <laughs> he just it's grabs one of those. You. It's one of those where he just grabs you in, and you're like kind of <laughs> shocked. Yeah, you're maybe like, a little, maybe a little offended, but uh, what shocked can you do? at the most point. Because you're there's right, no one who can you challenge you, and you're That's millions true. of dollars. And if you do try to challenge that handshake, you got the Secret Service tackling you. Exactly. So, and that's exactly oh what they're doing right now, tackling down Vortex right here. As Jose Fumi is gonna land a lot of CC right there. Vortex is gonna get destroyed and Ornhub 2.0 taking down some towers. Rexalis as well gonna get taken down right there. Stamping their name to game one is gonna be Ornhub 2.0. Ah. And Ornhub, I mean, Vortex, if you're Vortex, you gotta go into this next game thinking about a lot Ornhub. Now just being a little BM right here, just, you know, saying, look at us. We are your opponents. Look at me. I am the captain now. So that'll be Vortex taking that win, or not Vortex, Ornhub taking that win decisively in game one. And if you're Vortex, you gotta go back to the drawing room like, man, we, we didn't expect this. I mean, yeah, plans are one thing, but the real deal is different. And well, you, I mean, this might just be a—they might just be shell shocked after this game. Well, after game one, let's see if they can just try to push themselves and try to go to the second game of this best of three. So after game, like after a sad defeat like that i mean just how do you pick yourself back up and try to even bring it to the second game well if you're vortex you have to realize you just got punched in the jaw but the best competitors take a punch and then throw their own punch back and that's what game two is about you gotta read from your draft take away some of these comfort picks and also if you're going to have two scaling lanes you have to have a way to protect them yes tracker's knife has been taken away but you have to either get your support to roam and ward for you or get a jungler who will can build something like an eye of the watcher something that's innovative that can retake that vision whether you might have to go eye of the aspect something to give you that vision to help your mid laner or get a mid laner like malzahar i don't know if i don't know if uh kurama plays malzahar but get something that can build some sort of warding item to give you some safety in these lanes and then once you have that bottom side of the map safe, play through this Scion. Give him an early lead. An early lead Scion is something that's extremely scary, especially one that has globals. He does a lot of damage early on in the game. Give him that advantage. But most of all, just reform your drafts. Realize you have to take away Hamlet's Talia. You have to take away Astris's Vein. And just play your game. You know, don't get flustered by this new team that just punched you in the mouth. Come back, continue to play your game, and just make adjustments to your draft.
Well, that is going to be game one going onto the side of Ornhub 2.0. They have switched over sides. And right now, we're going to see if they can try their best to come back with a game two and potentially push it to game three. So, just hopefully after that first game, they don't get that demoralized. But it is a, it is a long stretch. I mean, it's only week one. And even if you're losing these first games, it's not that big of a deal. So right. Just... And that's Hopefully, what you. Yeah. And that's what you have to take into account if you're Vortex. That might give you a little bit of solace going into this, uh, into the second game, which is, hey, it's the first games of the, of the season. Let's not get too broken down by this. We can come back and win, and if not, we still have another season to improve. I mean, another game. You know, another few games in the season. You have seven weeks for this, man. You have more games to improve and come back and figure this out. And if you're Ornhub going into the second game, don't change much. You know, you're obviously going to have to come up with new picks for when they ban your Talia, which they should do. They might also ban the Vein out. Just, But come back, be ready, be prepared in the pick and ban phase, and just keep playing your game. The aggression works. The early aggression work for you don't change anything too drastically and you can come up with a 2-0 but if you're vortex trying to get this 1-1 major changes to your pick and bands if you're the bottom lane if you're shooting fruit and man walrus you had to play that early game better yes you got surprised by the tri bush camp but you had to try and punish this vein earlier before this brom can hit a spot where you can peel for her before the talia can hit a spot or whatever other mid laner that uh, that Hamlet pulls out because he's most definitely going to pull out something that can still roam before he can hit that point where he can roam to the bomb lane to give them assistance and take advantage of that weak point before it hits critical mass. And one of the things that I actually do have to uh, acknowledge that, or actually just give praise to, is uh, for Ornhub 2.0, they were ahead the whole game, but they did not play cocky. They slowly let their lead snowball out they did not aggressively or not just aggressively but like stupidly play out their lead just wanted to force fights and try to end the game quickly they played it slowly they did not play it super aggressively they just put out the they, they got all their objectives and they slowly led onto it and they did not actually lose any part of their lead that's why the kills are so low on the side of uh vortex exactly and flash to the high level high paced fast world that I definitely belong to, which is called Plat Plus Diamond Challenger Play, definitely not Silver Play. We call that hitting your win conditions. And that's yes. all Orn Hub did was they said our win conditions is get an early lead, use to lead a roam to a side lane, get that lane ahead, preferably obviously the vein Brom lane, get them ahead and just snowball it. But don't be greedy, play for vision play where your advantages are at, which was in the bomb half of the map, and don't do anything extra, and they did that. Like you said, they didn't be, they weren't greedy, and it wasn't that they weren't greedy because they were panicking or cocky, you know? They just knew that if we over-greed, this game can turn extremely fast because, like we said, that Azir and that Tristana scale incredibly fast. You give them early kills, and it doesn't matter if your Vayne's fed or if your Tulia's fed. That Azir will be able to out-damage all of them in a team fight because it was AOE. But we've been in picking bands. We already see coming in from the side of Orn Hub. The Camille ban coming out on red side, not very surprising. She's extremely strong into something like a sign like you just saw Pokimane lock in. Skarner as well, something you can't give over to blue side. Um, while on the other side, you see the Kha'Zix, Nidalee, and Talia ban coming out. Talia, some that we knew was going to be gone. And Nidalee and Kha'Zix, those two are really aggressive junglers that can be extremely dangerous when playing from the blue side of the map. But now we'll probably see Vortex lock in their bottom lane. They've already locked in Tristana. Let's see if they lock in that support. They don't want that Talia to go onto the side of Hamlet because Hamlet did wreak a lot of havoc when put on the Talia. So they actually let the Shivana open. They could try to do the same thing. I really did like overrate Shivana, especially in the early game, being able to punish Loker like that. Especially because you know that Nunu is just that super farm heavy jungler, just being able to punish the jungler, just being able to punish that Nunu, just put Overrate so far ahead, gave Hamlet that opportunity to snowball, gave Asterisk the opportunity to snowball. So Overrate is 
playing well in that early game, and I'm just commending this Overrate's jungle. Right, like Overrate, I mean, he played his Shyvana, especially those aggressive plays where, like, he flashed under two towers to get the new new. Just knowing the limits of his champion and playing to those well, we do see Orna blocking their bottom lane, immediately taking the Varus Braum, and that's going to be such a powerful early game lane. Just locking that in, they know the Tristan came out, so they're going to go ahead and get that out of the way before anything can be banned out. You do see the Gnar coming in from the side of Vortex to counter the Scion, something that doesn't... It it definitely wins the lane against Scion. Not extremely hard, but will be comfortable. Mainly, he doesn't win as hard because he got his Q nerf, so those boomerangs don't come out as often, so the harass isn't that bad. You do see Orianna ban, and then the Sejuani, they pick that to be able to absorb any aggressive junglers that the side of Ornhub might pick. You see, they're not wasting any bans on the jungle. They're going to continue to ban out Hamlet. But Sejuani is extremely good at just absorbing early game junglers that are aggressive just because of her passive being able to absorb an extreme ton of damage while jungle while jungling and not necessarily need as many resources as the next jungler to get ahead just because of her status. We do see the Tom Kinch ban as well. So that signals to me that Ornhub is trying to find a lot of single target uh, damage and champions. You see the Varus with the Chain of Corruption. Tom Kinch counters that. Uh, Tom Kinch counters just about any type of engage you can think of. Yeah. And when you're a team that plays aggressive like Ornhub, you want that gone. And then they're going to ban away the Alistar. Just an annoying champion, especially on something that's low mobility like the Varus. Getting him out of the way. Now we'll see what shooting forward picks for his support. He will lock in the Tark. I think it's a smart pick. I'm actually kind of curious to see how the Nar and Sejuani and these picks come together. Because, I mean, there's a lot of CC if you can actually land those together. So, quite possibly, these team fights would be pretty explosive, especially with the Tarek as well. So, ex I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I love explosive team fights. As, as a play by play caster, that's what you live for, right? Explosive team fights and a lot of people just going in and dying. So, I want to see more kills. I want to see more deaths. And I want to see a lot of CC coming in for these team fights. So, I actually love both these compositions right now. And you see Ornhub immediately answering back. I like to say that they're locking in. Wait, are you about to see the volley bear? Please, 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 please. That is a lot of single target, like you said. I mean, <laughs> lad, lad. The... Oh, ah. no, it's not. I, I wanted it as well. That was a lot of single target CC. Kane's still a very single target oriented jungler. Still very aggressive as well. I like to call what Ornhub picked as it's single target with a little bit of insurance. And the insurance comes from the Scion and the Vladimir Scion. Extremely good at his ultimate. A lot of his CC is AoE. And in Vladimir, obviously, his ultimate Hemo Plague is, you know, AoE as well. And then everything else is mainly centered at we're going to find a carry and we're going to try and delete them as fast as possible. Chain of Corruption with Kane, Vladimir, Braum, trying to find that target. But their only issue is the target coming in from Man Walrus if the ultimate is timed correctly, cancels out all of that. And so it's going to be a game of can Ornhub make Manwall use his cosmic radiance early so that the next fight he doesn't have it, or can they blow up a target fast enough to just negate Manwall versus ultimate? Because otherwise, Vortex's team comp looks extremely strong. They have a lot of team fight and a lot of CC. The Rise, extremely strong at team fighting, especially in the mid game. Tristana scales really well. We've already talked about this before. And as long as Man Walrus, he's the key in this. If he can time his ultimates correctly, it's going to be extremely hard to stop Vortex. And it's another game where Ornhub will have to get their advantages early. Otherwise, it's going to be a struggle for them to succeed. Well, both team comps have been locked in. Both Vortex and Ornhub 2.0 have locked in their composition. And we have switch sides, so it is going to be Vortex on the blue, or sorry, Ornhub 2.0 on the blue side, Vortex on the red side. Game one did go to Ornhub 2.0, so they have the lead in the best of three series, but it is best of three. It is not best of two anymore, like last season. So if Vortex do win this game, they will push it over to a third game. But right now, let's see if they're able to either defend themselves or if Ornhub 2.0 can come in with a 2-0 sweep. But rounding out the compositions right here, a lot of single target CC going in on the side of Ornhub 2.0, as he said. And just both teams having a lot of uh, teamfight prowess. 
And if I was a betting man who liked to bet on just the team and how they performed in the previous game. And you do that for OneHub, right? Yes. And how they perform individually, you know, looking at their stats from plans and the champions they're playing. I would bet on OneHub. But right now, I'm going to go on the side of Logic, which says that logically, if Vortex is a solid team, which they dodged relegation comfortably last season, I believe, as Royal Air, which means they were a solid team, that this composition and this game is in favor of Vortex. You have the Sejuani who can provide those early ganks before level six, unlike the Kane who, unless the gank is performed extremely, extremely well, unless this, you know, this Braum can find concussive blows and find the stuns or the Scion can find some sort of knockup onto his lane opponent, Kane takes a lot of gank assists to find ganks because he doesn't do an extreme amount of early game damage without a lead. The Sejuani can pull off ganks level three, level four, whenever she wants to pre six. And she has a lot of early game CC on her side with the Tarak Rise and Nar. So there's a lot of opportunities for Loka to be proactive on the map and get these early leads to shut down the Orn Hub team uh, win conditions that they have set for themselves. So, you know, a logical man would bet Vortex. And I think I'm going to go on the side of logic right here just because I like their team composition better. However, if you are Rexalis, you have to realize you have a target on your back because of all the lanes that are on your team's side. Yours is the most gankable, just because if they can get you to use your hop, then Scion can easily knock you out, knock you up with a decimating smash and allow Kane the time to find the damage to get a kill in the top lane. So you have to be extremely careful, brother. Otherwise, you'll be the first one to fall down. Because for the side of Ornhub, it's extremely hard to gank any of these other lanes. Well, I think I have to dis. Oh, I think I have to go on the other side of what you said, right? So if you're gonna go with logic, then I, I mean, I'm gonna have to go with what I saw last game and just go with Ornhub. So I'm gonna uh, disagree with your uh, pick of logic and just go with Ornhub just to spark some controversy with you. Hey, man, to each his own. And that is you true. have you have some good points. We saw what they just did to them. However, I don't think that. Vortex did a good job. Ooh, excuse me. I don't think Ornhub did a good job. Not Ornhub. Vortex did a good job in the draft last game and just gave away too many picks to the side of uh, Ornhub. And therefore, that's one of the main reasons they lost that game. Yes, there was some uncoordination. And yes, Ornhub played an extremely good early game that was smooth and just took advantage of where Loker on Nunu was lacking as far as his ability to challenge the Shivana and her early invades, and just challenge how well he was able to gank and counter gank lanes. But this game, I feel like the playing field is more even. And actually, we see Jose Fumi with the Glacial Augment. I haven't seen that on Braum yet, so we'll see how that one works out in lane. Just looking at the load-in screen. I but... do think that uh, once level 6 hits for this bottom lane, I do give the bottom lane to Astros and Jose Fumi, just like that Chain of Corruption and the Glacial Fissure. I mean, the CC is insane. If you can land it, only if Man Walrus can land some Gauntlet, if just time the Cosmic Radiance well, then possibly they win a fight. But I, it hits to level 6. Astros and Jose Fumi, I do expect a lot of explosive explosivity when they hit that uh, ulti range. Oh, don't get me wrong. Things have to be played extremely well by the side of uh, Vortex, especially like you said in the bot lane. There's so much early power from this Braum even before six with concussive blows and Varus's early damage, which is why he's picked in lane. As we actually see five men yeah. run to the top lane. They're running to the top lane right now. Could they be trying to catch something out? Uh oh. They I, they did ping I, them out, so Nar pinged them out. Yeah, yeah I, I, they've been seen by now. They're just roaming around trying to find something early. I don't think they will. This is some of the early aggression that Ornhub showed in the planes where they are not afraid to go for these level one invades and in this one they do win you obviously see vortex back off because they don't win this level one brahm is so strong on the level ones but you do see them trading early vision so advantages weren't lost by the side of vortex they just kind of traded advantages and now they'll be able to see where over eight starts 
Yeah, they just know where the junglers are going to be. That's just going to be like a vision ward. I mean, a nice aggressive play to try to do something. They do know they do have Jose Fumi. So if someone tries to challenge it, like you said, those concussive blows with the passive are going to be super strong. So, I mean, it's not a bad thing to go in as five. They put down the vision. They just going to start off this red buff for um, overrate right there as he takes the Raptor camp. So both junglers do start on the bottom side. Probably going to rotate up to the top side. Pretty standard jungle starts for the game. Right. And I want to see where Overrate heads next because one thing that can be strong about Kane is he does have enough early damage to where if he can find such one that's low on health, depending on the type of leash that she received, he could try and go for that early kill. However, he's not doing that. He's just going to go for his straight toward his blue for the uh, two buff star. Actually, he's going to go to his wolves for the, you know, easy level three, possibly at the top lane. But back to our conversation about the bot lane because... You were right. The damage from Astris on this early Varus is extremely powerful, along with Braum and his concussive blows. So Man Wallace and Schodenfrode had to play this, you know, extremely safe. As you already see Jose Fumi going for the early level 2 all-in, trying to find that Winter's Bite. Couldn't find it, but they already had to push in. Every single lane for the side of... Uh, wow. Ornhub pushed in, and that's why you see... This Oprah is Loker again might be in a bit of a trouble. He does... Dodge it, the boomerang comes out, Hamlet trying to rotate up, Karama putting down some damage onto Hamlet. This might be not good for Hamlet, he has to use the pool, he has to flash away, that's gonna be the flash coming in from Karama as well. First blood going in on the side of Karama right there, as over it is gonna chase him out, that's gonna be the, s the snare to just slow him down, but I mean, Hamlet now on the other side of getting destroyed. Not getting destroyed, but on the other side of getting a death. Yeah, and he gives up the, the early first blood. I want to say he underestimated Kurama's early damage on the level 2 rise, and then also thought that he would have his blood rush back up in time to get that that uh, empowered Q off to get himself back up to basically about half health. But then by the time he realized that wasn't meant to be, he already had the ignite on him, which cut his healing in half, and then already had to use the pool. So it just took away his ability to even survive that. And then... Kurama had flash, just followed his flash and matched it, finds the early first blood. So now, Vladimir, he's already a dangerous champion when you get ahead of him in lane because he scales so well into these team fights. Now, oh, wrong side. Let's reverse all the way back. Rise, getting the early, early advantage. And now putting Vlad even further behind on his power spike will definitely damage his mid game spike because you want Vlad to get through the lane phase just a little bit behind if not even for him to have a lot of impact on these mid-game team fights now he's gonna be even further behind Karama's rise who will hit his power spike a lot earlier going for that tier of the goddess which has been revamped just a little bit with the new patches still gives about the same the same uh advantages did before but now just a little bit retooled and reworked i believe it should give 10 percent cdr I thought it did. Does it? But apparently, check. apparently I was wrong. I don't see it. Either that or just, they just haven't changed the tooltip yet. Um, maybe. One of the two. Next patch? Either. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Either way, that Rise now has the lane advantage he wants. And so now, for the first time in this series, Vortex have a winning lane. Yeah, and uh, here comes over it again, actually, and that's an easy kill for overrate just i think something that we haven't really been noticing this game was even though uh, hamlet did die in the early game how overrate actually invaded this new news or sorry the sejuani's jungle loker's jungle and just was able to just put so much pressure on a loker so that every time loker's running somewhere he's kind of scared and be like well where's overrate is he gonna pop out on the side of the wall is he just gonna come out randomly because just that pressure that overrate puts on the jungle in the enemy territory just it's, it's scary. Just look at how he jumped in. That was such an easy gang. It looked like... It was like butter, basically, right? Shooting through butter kind of thing. Right. They and easily he, got that kill. And he does it on every single champion. Oh. We, As we I have thought Hamlet was going to die again. But yeah. he escapes using the, the Sanguine Pool. You know, easy escape. Doesn't have to burn any sums. But he does it on every single champion he plays jungle. Not just the Kane. And we got a little distracted watching Hamlet lose that 1v1. But... Uh, the point being that overrate when his lanes are always pushed in like they always are because they just pick aggressive winning lanes 
it just leaves him so much room to be aggressive against his enemy jungler. Like we saw last game on the Shivana, while he didn't, while the only time he went in for the ones we won against Nunu was after counter ganking, he still was trying to go in for the early invades, find early vision, early camps against Loker's Nunu, and we're just seeing it again, but this time in a form where he can get these early kills and early skirmishes on this Kane. When we see actually Rixal is trying to sell for this early gank against Pokimane. Oh, overraise right here. That's going to be the Gnar knocking up. Overraid right there. Might be in a bit of trouble. That's going to be the ultimate coming in on the side of both Rexalus and Overraid. Sorry, both Loker and Overraid. Look, actually, Loker is not even ulti yet, but I, that was the what was that? that was the permafrost, not the ultimate. My bad. But both of uh, the top laners coming out without any deaths. Right, and that was. Uh, it's it, that on that one it's hard to tell who counter ganking it's almost like who came for the chicken or the egg because yeah. both junglers had a gank in mind it's just that overrate arrived first and loker was like oh wait there's a cane in the lane now i, <laughs> I got to go in later. <laughs> so but at the end of the day he does want to trade which does at least give him the ability to regain the loss he had against overrate because now overrate had their recall now things jungle timings as far as camps are somewhat reset and now Loker is just isn't that such a disadvantage as he was before but still works Salas because of that gank is still being punished by Pokimane because Pokimane didn't have to recall after that gank he just continued the farm didn't have to use TP Rex Salas had to stick around to catch these waves now he's at a quarter health and you know once overrates done clearing camps he's at threat of being ganked again that is Rexal is back at half HP with the Mega Nar on. Pokemon putting down a lot of lot of poke onto uh, Rexalus right here, just bullying him a little bit. He is currently one and zero, so does have that one kill advantage. Both these top laners have about similar CS, so like only one to one right now, but not a big gold lead to any team. Obviously, slight gold lead to the side of um, Horn Hub 2.0. But other than that, not a big deal. Here comes Overrate for another gank. Rixal is just going to try to bounce away. Ultimate for Overrate is not up, but here comes Loker possibly on that bottom lane. And he'll look to try and take advantage of the fact that Overrate showed in the top side. Here he goes. Here he goes. Where's the Glacial Prison going to come in? That's going to be used on to Jose Fumi. They don't look like they want to chase onto him. He's going to escape from that one, and both of them go out alive as the Buster Shard kind of saved out Jose Fumi right there. And that's just the feels bad, man. You finally find an engage you want on the bomb side. You know this game that Ornhub doesn't have the globals they had last game to try and counter your gank. And you land the Glacial Prison on the Braum, who then just face tanks it with the Unbreakable Will. And then after that, yes, you got their flashes, but they still have Healing Knight. And like you said, the Buster Shot, Shade and Fruit trying to tr find the kill execute. Maybe thinking some follow-up damage is going to come through to maybe cause the explosive charge to get the kill, but it's never happened. And now that's just time wasted from the side of Vortex, which just gives Overrate time to invade. I want to say, yeah, he took, he double buffed Loker on red buff. So now he has his red buff, he has Loker's red buff, and he's looking for another gank in the top lane. And now that advantage that you just regain for the for Loker on this Sejuani getting back even you've lost it but now Jose Fume going Ooh, low I don't, I don't really like that <laughs> yeah I'm... that is interesting right there they should have committed or not used the cosmic radiance a little miscommunication there I think Man Walters was, ex best. Man Walters was expecting uh Shin and Fruit to probably go for more yeah I, did... I, it was optimistic at best I I feel like it was a situation where Shaden Fruit surprised his, his support by going in that way, and then Manraw was thinking that there might be a return engage from Asterisk and Jose Fume, who don't have their ultimates back up, but concussive blows can still guarantee a kill, tried to save his, his AD carry from a return engagement that just never happened, and now they're missing the Cosmic Radiance, which just opens up a 2v2 all-in, because Asterisk has his chain of corruption back up, and the Glacial Fissure will be back up extremely uh, quickly as well. Yeah, uh, soon Chain of Corruption, they are both level 7, so we did talk about those ulti power spikes, Cosmic Radiance is not up, I was, it was as it was used in the last uh, engage that uh, this bot lane tried to do, so they are in an ulti disadvantage, and for this bottom lane where these ultis mean so much, that's a 
that's a big deal. Oh yeah, and then on top of that, they uh, Orn Hub also has a global advantage because Re Rexalis had to TP back to lane to try and get the farm that he was losing against Pokimane. And so now they have ult advantage, TP advantage, Hamlet. He doesn't have TP anymore, but he could always try and find a roam to the bomb lane if coordinated. You see Loker here, the chain of corruption does miss as well. So, yeah. but I think on that one, it would have actually, that favored Orn Hub because they would have gotten counter engaged well, immediately. They're going to go in right now. That's going to be a two man stun going in on the side of Vortex right there. Buster shot and is going to land onto Astros. Shadenford is going to pick up a kill looking at the top lane. As this directed camera mode pans me up there, Rexalis and Pokemon look like they're going to be having a fight. Slowed down, stunned up is going to be Rexalis right there. Is Pokemon going to try to use the unstoppable onslaught to go in? Probably not, but a nice kill went in on the side of uh, Vortex on the bottom lane. And they finally find the engage they wanted. It's fully coordinated, and they find the kill onto Astris. And now they're going to try and find this turret. Over it will find his way to the bottom lane to try and cover this. We do see TPs come in though. Both TPs coming in, an unstoppable onslaught is gonna be used. That looks like it might be a big team fight going in. Glacial Prison is gonna land as well. Cosmic Radiance coming out, double kill is gonna go out onto the side of Kurama. A Shoyden, Shaden Fruit and friends. I've not really done much here. And Ornhub trying to be even more optimistic than Vortex was as now both teams are posturing. Look out. Kurama, if he can find a good rune prison, he could have found maybe a kill, but they do back away. But going back to that fight, Ornhub trying to be optimistic. They're like, yes, we did lose Ashes, but we need to save this turret and not give them first brick onto this Tristana. Over eight came to the bottom lane to assist. And you see Pokimane trying to find the TP play, trying to gain numbers advantage, but he forgot that Kurama with his unsealed spellbook does have TP. So Kurama immediately just TPs the bomb lane. They regain numbers advantage, plus Cosmic Radiance was back up, so they easily turn that fight around. And now you're seeing Vortex with a 4-1 lead. It's only 400 gold up, but now that they have this bottom lane lane pressure and his turret down, they could easily try and go for an all-in or at least a four-man push to try and get first brick in this bottom lane. As we do see fighting in the jungle, however. Loker is gonna land the permafrost onto Overrate right there. Is Overrate gonna try to go in for more? Hamlet actually in a bit of trouble. Kurama might be able to go for more. That's gonna be the pool trying to stop him now. And then the, the flash actually, last second flash lives. Hamlet is gonna live right there as Loker and Overrate, they're still meeting up with each other. Will Overrate be able to try to get this one? Overrate does have the ulti up. Loker does not have the ulti up. They're just gonna be fighting for this Raptor camp. Where's the permafrost gonna land down as Overrate does wanna try to go in for more? There's the ulti coming in from Overrate. Overrate's gonna pick up a kill on the Loker as Rexalis is gonna end off the life of Overrate right there. And that's gonna be a one for one at the end of the day. And on the back end of that, we saw Overrate and Loker going at it Loker finding over eight on that early invade on red buff. He does find the kill onto the Sejuani, but then he gives red buff over to Rexalis, who needed so much help in that top lane and now just found it with the red buff. That burn and health region going to help him sustain against this Scion. He also has TP advantage as well, so we can look for another play on this bomb side of the map. And on the back end of it, we saw Kurama taking out Hamlet. Hamlet trying to rotate up to help his jungler. But then Kurama, just using that early rise power that he gained, he already has his Rod of Ages and his Lost Chapter. So, so much CDR and mana on his side already. Just easily taking out Hamlet quickly and quietly. So much that we didn't almost even notice it happening on the back end. So, while you would think that Ornhub might have gained an advantage by taking out Sejuani, they just even trades. Actually, a two-for-one trade just... Keeps the advantage in Vortex's favor, and now they're going to continue to play this bomb side of the map. They have a dragon up. It's Mountain Drake, which will do wonders for their Tristana. And this 4-1 composition that they probably will be working toward, 4-1 or 1-3-1, I mean, it can come fully online with this Mountain Drake going into this mid-game. And this time, Vortex just being able to, like, erase what happened in game one and just reset their minds to play the second game just really a great showing coming in they're not it doesn't look like they're tilted at all they're showing great they're 2k gold ahead they're currently five and two so this is a great showing for the early game of, of vortex i mean last but, game it was not as good but able to erase what happened and just bringing themselves to this part of the game just a really nice showing to try to push themselves to the third game of the series right this game they're just so much more coordinated 
I don't know if it was rust from not playing for a while, but this game they seem so much more coordinated. They seem like they want know know what they want to do around the map, and at the same time they're just preying on the mistakes that Ornhub made. Hamlet losing that early advantage to Karama was big because now Karama can just out roam him and match his roams and out damage him. Also with the TP. I, oh wow, we see the the a missed glacial, glacial prison. prison. Feels bad, man. X smithied it all the way, but now they have. The man, that's an dead. old meme. That's that's an old meme right there. You think it's dead? Is it dead? Uh, it's, it's not dead meme. Because I think it's I think it's dead because Xmitty's gotten a lot better since those days. Okay, he's playing, a, he's playing a lot better now. But uh, as we talked, there's gonna be a team fight. That's gonna be the unstoppable onslaught. Use here's the juicy team fights Here coming in. Cosmic radiance as well. Pokemon is actually super low. Doesn't get taken down. Finally gets taken down at the end of the day. Jose Fumi's gonna be in the middle of the fight. And a nice Nar ulti to slow them down and try to stop out this team fight. Man Wallers and friends are trying to go for more overrates and a bit of trouble right here as he's trying to escape from that one. Hamlet is gonna be a little more than half HP. Are they gonna be able to actually win this team fight? Overrates trying to go in for more. Doesn't look like they can do anything, and that Gnar ultimate of Rexalis just putting down the poke as they do try to fight for more. Hamlet, gonna be in the pool, is gonna get taken down low, but he's not out yet as Astros is in the backside hitting down with those auto attacks. And at the end of the day, that's uh, I don't even know that that was a two for two. I, I think it was a uh, three, uh, two for, I think it was a two for two, yeah. Yes. Counting numbers now. I might know it was a three for two, I believe. I believe that, uh, um, no, you're right. It was a two for two. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to count. Hey, I am a Especially with mate. those long team fights, you look at the death counter, it's like, well, they're all alive. Right. Fight. <laughs> but talking about long team fights, that's exactly what Ornhub wanted. You saw that although Ornhub kind of botched the initial engage, you saw Pokemon come in with the ultimate, but it didn't catch anyone in the back line, and over it wasn't able to find his way to this Tristana or to Karama. Raz doing so well in these team fights with his team fight mobility and just being able to pump out so much damage in the middle of all of that. But at the same time, Vortex wasn't able to find their uh oh. Pokemon might be in a bit of trouble here. Rocket jump to try to put more damage down, short and fruit. Gonna escape from that one right there. As Overage is gonna pick up the red buff on the bottom lane. He's just too tonky. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean that fight was just no one got to Asher's in the back line from the side of uh, Vortex, and that just allowed him to continue to pump out damage. Overrate, now that he's gone, Ross, he lives for these long 18 fights where he can just pump out damage and CC and lifesteal. And Hamlet being able to live as well was huge because that's also another area that Vladimir excels in. It's just the long 18 fights where he continue to pump out damage, and they turn it from what could have been a zero for two trade into a two for two. However, it still gives Vortex map control because they were still able to get that mid lane turret which opens up the map and they find Asterisk with the Glacial, glacial Prison. Glacial Prison finds Asterisk and Scheidenfruit picks up the kill on Asterisk. Vortex just showing out some dominance this game as they say that they messed up last game but they're not going to mess up again. As they try to push out this top side. And Orna finally making some mistakes in this game. We saw it early in the game with failed 1v1s and roams without much vision and now you're seeing it leaving your ad carry alone in the top lane without support or help the easy roam came in from the side of vortex and we actually see the cosmic radiance come out they want to take the tower dive. coming in this looks like it's going to be a dive shredder fruit's going to try to go onto jose fumi he's going in far stunned up by mad walrus on the over right right there and he might be getting the ultimate down onto shredder fruit he's gonna have to use the rocket jump out as the towers are actually focusing him but he does not get taken down at the end of the day Overrate is still alive trying to stick around and try to help out this tower right here he might be in a bit of trouble he might not have wanted to go in for this one or he might have actually picked up more kills but here comes karama to end up the day but here comes the unstoppable onslaught as well Pokemon is going to get stunned up by Mad Walrus. Here comes Asher's with the flash to try to get onto Mad Walrus. A few more auto attacks is going to pick him down, but the shields and the stuns, or the heals, lets him live a little longer. But Asher's picks up a kill. He's currently 2-2-1. Two, two, and one. And it almost looked perfect for Vortex. It looked like the perfect tower dive, Cosmic Radiance, kill Overate and Jose Fume, get that tower gold as well and just open up the map even more however they allowed this rost to just extend and prolong this fight just saw out the innate life steal along with his ultimate just uh, giving time for the rest of the team to catch up we had to realize asterisk died and then it had enough time to respawn and come back to that fight and claim a kill 
and so was Sion. Pokimane had enough time to die, come back, and help stall that tower. So these are the type of things that Orn Hub need. Just stop the snowball. Another game, except on a different foot, where a team has to stop the snowball and stall out the snowball of the other team. Now, in this game, will it prove to help them? It's a little bit of a toss-up, because Tristana still does scale better than the Varus, in my opinion, when it comes to late mid-game. For sure. Hamlet, yeah. however, will get caught. Ooh, Glacial Prison actually doesn't land. Here comes a nice oh assault on the three members. That is amazing. And here comes Astros and the team. This might be really bad for the side of Vortex. They might actually ace them. That's going to be a double kill. That's going to be a triple kill going in on the side of Astros. Actually, a shutdown going for Hamlet. But that was an amazing unstoppable onslaught right there. Pokemane, you the real MVP. When everything seemed to have gone terribly wrong, Hamlet getting caught out in the jungle by the Sejuani trying to get some wards and get ready for this Infernal Drake. He just pulls off a three-man unstoppable onslaught that does so much damage because he got them at max range, that 250 damage coming through. And now they're going to start Baron. However, Gnar will be here to respond. And they are in the pit. He can if he can land a stun with his ultimate, but he won't even get there. He goes He's not going to get hard. there in time, and he gets taken down, and they're going to just go for this Baron. And just like that, in the blink of an eye, they have changed the game around at this time. Ornhub 2.0 have put their foot down and they are not letting Vortex try to get this game easily off this one. They do not want a game three, but is Loker gonna be able to steal this? And he does oh steal this. He takes the Baron. They're gonna go in for more. This might be a second team fight. Cosmic Radiance is gonna come down as well. Shredder Fruit might be in a bit of trouble. He's gonna be in the middle of the team fight. Gets taken down. Pokemon might be the second one as well. Karama is in a bit of trouble. Gets taken down and like we were talking back and forth, Tipsy Turvy, well like a seesaw going up and down and an ace coming in on the side of Ford Hub 2.0. Oh, Vortex, that has to feel so bad. You get the Baron steal, but then you can't find the fight. You get over eager. Your your fight is staggered while your front line dies early, even though you steal the Baron, the rest of your team arrives. And you're basically a team without a front line that has to rely on the cosmic radiance. And if you can't put out enough damage to kill Asterisk or Hamlet before that Cosmic Radiance completes, then you're basically done. His overrate might actually fall here to Infernal Drake. Actually, no, he doesn't. He survives. Oh, overrate gets taken down still. Here's the Meganar coming in. Pokemon might be in a bit of trouble. Glacial Prism is actually gonna land onto Asterisk right there. Shut down, going out. Jose Fumi's gonna be the next target. He gets stunned up. He's gonna get some auto attacks down. There's the Permafrost to stop him as well. Will Hamlet and Pokemon be able to stop this up? Concussive Blows is going to finally land onto Loker. Slowed up, but not taken down. Well, they do, on the bright side, get away with the Infernal Drake. They do lose two. And that now will give Vortex the push that they wanted. So, Ornhub just throwing advantages back over to the side of Vortex. They get their second tier mid lane turret. Now they're going to go to this top lane as well. Gonna go ahead and use the Rise Realm Warp Rise to up. get there. So now they're just gonna earn twice the gains they lost off that earlier fight and then back away. And unless an Unstoppable Onslaught can come through, there's not much that Ornhub can do about it. And so now this is just an influx of gold going back over this Tristana. She already has her Static Shiv and her Infinity Edge. Probably gonna go back and finish her Rapid Fire Cannon. This Rise will be able to complete his Leandry's Torment. So now these team fights are getting a little bit more dicey. And it'll be all about be all about whose front line, whose tanks can find the initiation on the other team's back line. And I all think these... every time they have this like weird tipsy turvy back and forth uh, fights, the the person that's winning is Tristana because they're just putting so much gold into this Tristana's bank as Pokemon gets caught out and taken down again by the Tristana. Like you were saying, who's gonna scale harder? It probably is gonna be the Tristana. There's gonna be another team fight. Glacial Princess is gonna land as well. That's gonna be the Cosmic Radiance double kill going inside. Buster no shot, reset. rocket jump, resets, triple kill going in on the side of Shoyden Fruit right there. And holy moly, this game is just going off. And Pokemon being too aggressive, trying to push that mid lane turret, dies and then gives Tristana the resets. And like you said, she's so huge. She's a three arm Tristana. And while this Varus has three items of his own, it doesn't, this Tristana just scales harder. And with the backup she has, yes, the Glacier Prison misses, but it slows down Asterisk enough to keep him in the game. And therefore, just allows him to continue to catch up. And now they're just going to continue to destroy Ornhub's base. 
destroy Ornhub's base and will Ornhub be able to respond from this one? Unstoppable onslaught and Jose Fumi jumps in as well. Hamlet is gonna be on the right side trying to do some work, but here comes over it. Will they be able to actually stop this? That's gonna be a three-man knockup on the side of Ornhub 2.0. Double kill is gonna go inside for short and fruit. He is popping off on the backside right here. That's gonna be the Zonya's hourglass on the side of uh, Hamlet as well as Quadra kill actually going out on the side of Short and Fruit. He is popping off right here. Kill after kill after kill as Ornhub 2.0 try their best to win another fight, but they lose that one. And that could have possibly been game. You actually see Vortex just going to. They don't have any waves and they don't have Rex Alice and being able to tank the Nexus turret, so they're gonna just keep going for outer turrets, try and get as many towers and inhibs as they can. They actually back off here, but. That fight, you you think that Ornhub might have turned it again, but no one gets to the back line. That's all these fights come down to is who can find the back line first. You see Astros tried to find his way there, but he's against the Nar and a Tristana. They just burst him down. He gets completely deleted. And after that, it's just front line versus front line. Hamlet still doesn't do, Hamlet doesn't do enough damage anymore to get through the sustain that's coming in from this Tristana and this Rise. And that's how vortex wins a fight and now they'll have priority over baron which will come back up in the next few minutes through this tristan alone i mean 12 3 and 4 shaden fruit's going off he is popping off and um <laughs> these team fights have been pretty wild honestly like just going back and forth just that from that middle game fights when we saw Vortex win, and then Ornhub win, and they go to the Baron Pit, and then they lose. Just, just so much tipsy-turvy in these fights. It's, it's kind of actually, like, yes, it's interesting to watch, but as well, it's, it is very lackluster in the play that they are making in these mid-games. They're not as decisive as they were potentially last game, but exciting nonetheless. And a lot of it is just target prioritization, as you will see. Vortex, go ahead and start making this push for this bottom inhib turret. It's just target prioritization, you know, figuring out, okay, this is the person we have to all in and burst down, and if we don't, then we lose the fight, and that's just something that neither team is doing. It's more of whoever can just output the most damage and be lucky enough to live long enough. Well, four man, we have to four right there. This might actually be good. Cosmic Radiance is going to be landed any damage with that cosmic radiance a three-man glacial fissure actually so much CC coming in on the side and this might be Astros trying to tip to have his team come back Rex Solace might be taken down soon but he's at a half HP with the Meganar they try to escape the one they cannot actually take down Shoyden food right there but Astros trying his best to claw his way back to trump his team and bring themselves back in this game as that team fight was the best thing they could ask for at that chat point and finally, Ornhub finds a way to get to the back line. They might not have killed Shaden Fruit, but they put down enough damage to knock him out of the fight. After taking damage from the Hemo Plague, plus Pokemane, and I believe Overrate got back there too. He just had to hop out, otherwise he was going to die. And once that main sword PS was gone, you know, there is nothing else that Vortex could do. Their front line, all they could do is just sit there and die. The Cosmic Radiance wore off, and then after Cosmic Radiance wore off, Rexalis had to back away. He's not building extremely tanky Gnar. He has the Black Cleaver and Thorn Mail with an adaptive helm. That's not the tankiest build you can go to sort of negate some of this AD damage. Most of the damage coming from Asterisk, but we do see Jose Fume taking a lot of damage. They're trying to contest this Baron Vision right now. This Baron coming up. This Baron is probably going to decide the game. And once and they, again, they can, can dance they, this. Yeah, they can. They can. And it will be all up to Ornhub. Can you find Shade and Fruit and Karama early? Can you at least take out one of those sources of DPS? You've already built Magic Resist to, you know, at least survive Karama. But can you find Shade and Fruit early? They're going to Realm Warp behind Realm the team and try and go for the end of the game. That's that's amazing. This is actually an amazing play. That's going to be the Realm Warp going in. They're going to try to go for these towers right there. Holy moly, that was crazy are they gonna actually start a team fight right here locals army sorry overrays not here yet but here's gonna be the team fight they're gonna be knocking up each other that's gonna be the cosmic radiance coming down as well shred is gonna try to jump out as they're gonna try to jump onto him as well bad is gonna get taken down jose fumi's gonna get taken down as well as kurama and ash is gonna be out at the backside they get taken down and it looks like vortex are gonna push themselves to the game two victory as they want to put themselves to this third game hamlet looks like he's gonna be the next target as well Double kill going in on the side of Karama as he finally gets taken down and Shaden Fruit's alive. He's going to end off this game for his team. And Vortex 
has said they will not give up that easily as Overrate tries his best to end off some last minute shenanigans, but he gets taken down at the end of the day. That's gonna be an ace, and that's gonna be Vortex putting themselves to game three. Holy cow. What a ballsy call from the side of Vortex. They recognize that Ornhub is spread out across the map trying to find where they are because Ornhub didn't have any vision around the map. They were just literally face checking everything, trying to figure out where and trying to at least guess where Vortex was. They realized they have the advantage. They have super minions pushing in. They go for the realm warp. And then when you think, oh, wait, but Ornhub can just pinch them after recalls and sign ultimate. Astris gets singled out by Kurama. He has to flash away and then run all the way to the other side of the base to try and run away. And once Astris is gone, Hamlet still doesn't do enough damage to try and single out a target and kill them in these team fights. And then Shaden Fruit is just left to his own devices to go ham. Goes 15, 3, and 7, finds two more kills at the end of that. And Vortex in the game and sends to a game three. That's the type of play we love to see going into the first week of Prophecy Cup, man. I'm hyped now. We've got our series on our hand, and it is getting late. It is 11.50 for our Eastern friends, so... Hey, you know what? If you have no work tomorrow, stay and watch the third game of Prophecy Cup. This is day one of our season four, first best of three, and we're putting ourselves to the third game of the series. I mean, you can't ask for anything better than that last team fight, or that last game as well. It was, it was maybe I mean, not the best play, but it was interesting, right? Hey, man, we have prime time entertainment right here. We have drama. We have action. We have comedy at some points. I mean, we're covering all the base that you need for a great screenplay right now. And we'll see if they can complete it with the final act here in game three. And we'll see who takes home the victory, man. I'm I'm excited. I'm ready for it. If you're Ornub, I don't even know if you feel bad about that game loss. It was a close loss. You had chances to come back. You just can't make so many early game mistakes. Hamlet put himself in a hole that kind of crippled his team going through the rest of his game, losing those early 1v1s to Kurama. And you see what happens when Ornhub doesn't have those globals to try and make up for team fights happening on their bottom side where they can be most vulnerable, where teams want to target them. The Shaden Fruit got his early lead from those early dives in the bottom lane. Vortex were finally able to execute. And Ornhub just didn't do enough to counter that. But at the same time, they just made too many mistakes that where they did get back into the game, it just let Vortex reclaim the lead they already had. Correct, you are. And game three is going to be an interesting one. Let's, uh, let's see what happens. I mean, we're right here waiting up and uh, ready to get into the third game. But it's been a action-packed day. It's been great games overall. Exciting. Just, holy cow. I mean, for whichever team wins this, you open the season knowing not only that you can deal with adversity by going full three games, but also you're starting off 1-0, baby. You're at the top of the table. That's you know? true. And that can be a real confidence booster. Yes, it's the first game of the season, sure, but same time, I mean, who doesn't want to start off with a win? And in this fashion, this could be a big confidence booster for whoever wins this game. Whoever loses, you know, you just got to go home and think about what you did wrong. And it, it's a heartbreaker, especially if you're Ornhub, because you come out and dominate game one. And then you let game two, after you come, after you seemingly come back, you go for a Baron. And after you lose the Baron, you still wipe a team fight. You come back and then still let it slip through your hands. And this game in your eyes, shouldn't have gone to a game three, and now you have to try and eke one out against Vortex. Hey, you know what? After seeing game one, I'm shocked that they played so well in game two, right? I mean, you can't even blame anyone for assuming that they were going to win game two, because it was such a stomp in game one, but I mean, hey, your logic worked, that's why you're a color caster and I'm not. <laughs> that's why I just yell about when I, I just yell what I see, and uh, you actually analyze the thing, so... I mean, you know? if there's any... If there's any constellation, friend, it wasn't, it didn't really even have a lot to do with the conditions that I laid out. Yes, there were a couple, there's one cosmic radiance I can think of that saved Vortex in a, in a fight, but that wasn't until the end of the game. 
I'll have to admit that most of Man Walrus's cosmic radiances didn't impact team fights and sway them. He kind of burnt them early in the beginning of the fight, didn't save them for key moments. And it was more just a lot of mistakes by Ornhub. Ornhub could have had this game. So by all means, that victory and that gloating power should have been yours. But because they couldn't close it out and finish it once they regained that lead, and then a lot of backdoor to happen on their watch, it's game three, and now anything can happen. It is game three. Anything can happen. I was going to say, you know what? Manny's chosen some great people because uh, you got that second prediction right, and I didn't. So obviously, <laughs> Manny's just picking the right guys to play on this team. Killing it. Killing it Basically with his killing choice it. of recruitment. That we call ourselves the the A team or the God Squad. Yeet. Please don't please don't uh, Oh don't, my gosh, was that was that was that T crank for a second? Jeez. <laughs> please don't fire me. Please don't um don't copyright me. Whoever owns I I, I wanna say that the A team owns the copyright to the A team, right? I don't know. Doesn't matter. We're in picking bands right now. We do see the target coming out from the side of Pornhub. That's something that you definitely need to get rid of. Had impact in way too many parts of the game and just nullifying to the aggressive team compositions that they want to play. We do see the Nidalee ban again coming through as well as Talia. I mean, obviously you can't give Hamlet to Leah unless you just want to give away a win to the side of Pornhub. Well, third game is going to be under the way. It looks like the Nar and the Tarek are going to be banned out, so they don't want to see that one coming in. So that's going to be quite interesting to see what they're going to play. Scion taking out as well. Pretty standard bans. They don't want to see, as the series progress, these champions that they played well on. Yeah, just straight reaction bans, not even having to do with the side you're on anymore, outside of the Nidalee, but that's also because Overhead has been playing a lot of Nidalee recently. Uh that's been mentioned before so just reaction bans from game two getting rid of scion who had pokemane had so many impact ultimates in that game that turned things around for the side of Ornhub, and then getting rid of the rise that hamlet has such a issue with as well as anar who had a, his own game changing ultimate in the mid lane and you see the gangplank coming back out again for pokemane you see zach locked in for rex out for loker just trying to get that early jungler before it gets banned away from him again something loker really really wants to play he's been playing it a lot actually in his solo queue account so one of his favorites we'll see if he can take it you can take the win home on this comfort pick Ooh. well Kank and tom kench coming out not banned out on this time tom kench is super annoying yeah, <laughs> as an 80 carry man i hate tom kench's man and that's something that you can't let through when you're on red side and pick and band, you can't let the Tomkins through because it doesn't really even matter what you're running. At some point in the game, Tomkins will ruin your day just because he has so much early game power, just because of his passive being able, you know, such early lane power with his passive, on top of just being able to nom nom and just say people, you know, you try, Zach Ultimate tried to come in with a Zach Ultimate. You know, unless you catch Tom Kinch in that Ultimate, he saves whoever you're trying to ulti. You know, Tristana. You're trying to burst down an 80 carry in lane. He gets nommed up and runs away and laughs in your face. And then you get salty and want to stab your eyes out. But you do see the Camille come through. And this is a pick that we've seen everywhere recently. Just because ever since the new changes, 8.3, 8.4, the meta has opened up for fighters in the top lane. And she's the premier fighter in the top lane. You get those early advantages for her. Not only can she split push, but she also has great single target um damage and engage ability so we'll be looking for the camille zach ultimate combos you're gonna come in with a zach ultimate and just try and bounce them back in the camille or vice versa you do see the varus band coming through though so obviously vortex recognizing that asterisk although he didn't get the job done was extremely dangerous on that varus with the damage he was pumping out but we do see hamlet as well on this oriana i want to see if he can get I want to see the Eye of the Watcher out right now. Gosh darn it. I want to see it on these utility mages. You want to Please. see that Eye of the Watcher. Give me the satisfaction of feeling right and not feeling crazy. Please. Isn't that, the, isn't that the best thing, though? As a color caster, you just assume all these... Not assume. You just be like, these guys should pick this, this, this. And then they finally get everything and they win the game. And you're like, 
obviously, because they listen to me, right? I should be their coach. I should be in the Basically. <laughs> Why don't you put yourself down? You know, I think on the Discord somewhere, it's like, looking for coach. I'll coach any team for, like, a small fee of, like, $200 per game or something, because I'm a legend. I used to coach, and after a moment, it just... I just realized it wasn't my thing, because... I think coaching sucks if your team uh, doesn't want to listen to you, so... Right, it just depends on the personalities. There's a whole For thing sure. you have to get into. The best coaches can deal with almost any personality, but I'm not one of those best coaches. That's why I'm right here and not over there. That's but we true. do see the Twitch coming through as well. He did play one game of it, Astros did, in the play-ins. And when he played it, he went ham. He was he had a perfect KDA on the Twitch, 10-0-8, 8, 100% win percentage on one game. So this is definitely the pocket pick duo of Tom Kitch and Tom Kinch and Twitch, and while they're not the most powerful in lane together, Tom Kinch gives Twitch the survivability he needs to get through lane phase and hyperscale into the late game. And although you do see nerfs to Twitch's contaminate, uh, pretty big nerfs, taking away like his rank five damage is cut in half. He's still extremely dangerous, mainly just because his ult still does so much damage in late game situations, and his Q has such good ability to sneak up and find. 1v1 and 2v1 assassination attempts on enemies. It's going to be up to Vortex to find a way into that backline to kill that Twitch early. That would be Rex Silas' job on this Camille. Find him, isolate him, and kill him with that Hextech ultimatum. We do see the victor come out, though. And this is a pick that has been fringe. It's been rising back up in the ranks. We've seen it a little bit in LCS. And after the patch changes, the CDR changes to items and also giving him more sustaining lane with more mana and health items ever since the AP itemization changes. He's in a spot where he can play safe, he doesn't die so early, he has good mana regen in the mid lane. So we're back to seeing control mages, baby, which we haven't seen uh, that often. I I honestly don't consider Azir a control mage, quote unquote, just because he's not, by control I usually mean like utility, like they can almost do everything for you. Azir... Can't really do everything for you, but Victor Oriana back in the meta. Still want to see my eye of the watcher, but I'm glad to see them back. And we do see the Shyvana actually coming back out for overrate. So once again, we'll see that early game jungler presence. And we'll see if his lanes can provide him with that backup. Well, here we are. On to the spectator delay. This is going to be the last game of the day. We have played it out. We are late into the night, and we are ready to see some awesome league of legends action so for those of you who have stayed up for those of you who are hoping that this game is going to end quickly so you can go to bed well this might be a this might be a juicy one so have fun stay in and if you are on twitch chat if you're ready to see someone win spam it out spam the team that you want both teams have locked in their compositions and we are getting ready to get into the game two games have been played and it's the last one so it's basically a best of one for this one so Whoever wins this game wins the series. And if you're on Hub, you're looking for sweet salvation. It took you three months, it took you 90 days to finally make it here. And now this is your chance to prove the rest of everyone in the league that despite what our name sounds like, the meme that it invokes, we are serious and we mean business. If you're Vortex, you're trying not to get taken out by the new kids on the block. You're trying to show, hey, we're still a solid team. Yes, we made changes, but that doesn't change who we are, who, what our identity is as one of the staple teams of Prophecy Cup. And this is your time right now. Both these teams trying to make a big statement coming into this game. Well, I want to see... I just kind of want this game to be like the second game, so there's a lot of fighting. I don't want it to be a stomp. I don't want to see this back and forth action because it makes it that much more interesting. Oh yeah, both teams this time. The first game, uh, Ornhub had more of a, you know, we're going to be early and aggressive so that then later we can pull you apart with a 1-3-1, and then we have the globals to immediately respond to when you try and engage on one of the side lanes. Second game, it was more, excuse me, team fight oriented, but really sloppy. You know, we had a lot of mistakes from both teams. It just happened that Vortex came out on top. This game, I want to see exceptional play where it's clean. I want to see clean, but hyper aggressive and hyper active play. I want to see both teams going at. They both have team fighting compositions. The only split push element is the gangplank and maybe overrate if he choose to on the Shivana. 
Everything else is team fight oriented. I don't want to see swords clashing. I want to see explosions everywhere. I want to see just people flying across the rift, you know, yordles hitting walls, Tom Kinches saving people's <laughs> lives. It's going to be like World War II out here, but with League of Legends. I, I was just going to say, you want to see Ornhub have their swords clash, so uh, that's going to be fun. Uh, <laughs> you have to make the meme once, right? <laughs> If you're going to have a name like that, you can't just not let it go. You know what? It's 2018 to each his own. If you yeah. want to see Swords Clash on an Ornhub platform, then that, that's for you. <laughs> Quite possibly. Maybe uh, to uh, grab more viewers, that's what's going to have to happen, I, I guess. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. However, you may get shut down, but you can, in today's day and age, you can just keep opening more accounts. That's and, true. I mean, if you want to be able to... If Prophecy wants to compete with Compete League, right? You just gotta mm. throw something juicy in there. Right. Give them a little bit of added entertainment you can't find anywhere else. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> Not in any other uh, Discord community can you find <laughs> a team like Ornhub with swords clashing. Yeah. No. But I mean... Hey, you're right. You're right. To each its own, let's not judge. Uh, it is 2018. We uh, allow all people to do whatever they want on their spare time, but... In 2018, it also means a great year of esports. It's not a meme anymore. Oh no, we we are no we we haven't been a meme for a long time, and now it's time for the the professional scene has now grown. Now it's time for the scene to, to grow. We've seen you know from Prophecy Cup to Upsurge to Compete League, all these amateur leagues just growing bigger and bigger. I love to see it. I just want to see this scene grow, especially with the college scene that needs a lot of venues to practice and play in. I'm ready for it, man. 2018 is going to be a big year for any esports you're in. Quote me on that. That's a hot take. It Probably is going to be a, really hot, a take. hot take. Hey, you know what? For these amateur leagues, Riot Games got a caster from an amateur league too, right? So, right. Kevin Flowers is coming in from an amateur league. So, hey, if you're a caster, look high, right? Look high. You might be like the next Blizzard Riot caster or something like that. But that's... That's a far stretch from where we are now, but we are getting into the third game of a Prophecy Cup. Day one of season four, and it has been amazing. This time we do not really see Ornhub 2.0 going in as a five-man trying to rush that top side, but nonetheless, Standard starts both teams. They're just starting up that line so that they have vision on both sides. Yes, unfortunately for Ornhub, this time they don't have that strong level one advantage to take that invade. Plus, generally, in a game three, when the stakes are this high, you just want to play safe. Don't give away any early advantages, making misplays. Looking at the laners, something that's interesting on Pokimane, I don't know if I saw it early. Uh, in the first game, when he played Gangplank, he did go Grasply and Dying instead of the Kleptomancy. So trying to look for that early sustain against this uh, Camille from Rexhaus, who will have the early advantage just because of the Comet being able to do so much early damage with the, I believe... What's their W called? Precision pro proto precision proto no tactical. Who, who's who's who? What what? Hey where? Who's who's W? Uh, Camille. Uh, it's tactical sweep though. I, I really it's only know the the ulti back sec ultimatum. <laughs> you know, honestly, like as a as a as a play by play caster, I should be memorizing all these uh skills. But I mean, after like a hundred forty champions like that, how could you remember every Q W E and R? So. I mean, it's already good enough that I know the ulties. Yeah. Hey, man, even the pros will just sometimes call it the ult, the Q, the W. It's, yeah. it's not that big of a problem. Just gotta know... I, if you know the meta ones, that's where it's at. Yeah, that's the important stuff. Basically. Right. But yeah, she will have that, that early advantage in the top lane. Um, we already see the invade coming from Shivana. She will just spot out the Zac and then back away. But now they have early vision, know where he is, and now... You'll see Astris and Jose Fume playing a little bit more aggressive, knowing that they don't have to worry about that Zack. Also knowing that he'll probably be pathing their way a little bit earlier because Pokimane is so far pushed in. And because Astris and Jose Fume are hitting that uh, level one, level two advantage, just going to push in Man Walrus and Schudenfreud. So now they'll be ready for it. Mid lane, not too much action. Unless either one of these mid lanes make a, a misplay mechanically in positioning. You'll just see them trade farm, try and trade lane advantages. You do see Hamlet getting the early push as well, which will give over eight once again the ability to early invade the bottom side of Loker's map and get that early vision. Yes, well, 
It's going to be quite interesting to see where the first blood is going to be coming in. Overrate, actually, in both the last games, we're near the... We're basically the reason why a lot of these first bloods have happened. Right, so, for better or for worse. Yeah, for better or for worse. So <laughs> here it comes. Loker is going into the top side and Pokimane blows a flash. And uh, that's about it. Pokemon. So flash burn. Oh, oh, you said... <laughs> I thought you were still talking. But oh, so, uh, yeah, my no, bad. Yeah. I just said the flash was burnt. You go <laughs> on. <laughs> but I mean, you know, he still had the burn flash just because Zach's ganks are that powerful. That even when you're anticipating them, it's really hard to just walk away from that instant CC from the elastic slingshot and the, you know, kiss, as some people call it, just like, you know, forcibly making them kiss. Otherwise known as a stretching strikes. But, uh, you know, still had the burn flash, but knowing where Loker was early and knowing that gank was probably coming allowed him to mitigate the loss he might have, you know, accrued from that early gank. So now he, you know, we know it's gangplank. So even when he gets behind, because of his gold generation, he's still even, if not ahead. So not too big of a loss unless he has the waste his TP, and then that's where things get dicey. But once again, they know where Loker, Loker is with this early ward advantage from Overrate. And now Overrate just going to recall and then start moving his way probably to the top side of the map again. It's uh, Rexalus and Pokemon both going in. I added Pokemon getting taken down hard by Rexalus. And something I do want to talk about this game is that both games of Game 1 and 2, Karama and Hamlet did pop off. So I do want to see which mid laner will pop off harder right now it looks like karama gets chunked out a bit harder but i'm gonna say whoever does well in that middle lane whichever jungler helps that middle lane that team will win because we've been seeing it in the series and victor will still need that assist as we already see zach roaming around the mid lane getting ready it with a gank because orion still does win that early level one just because we haven't seen these champions in a minute in the competitive scene doesn't mean that the advantages have changed. Victor is still a scaling champion that will still need to upgrade his uh, his prototype hex core at least one level first before he can actually get an even lane advantage against this Orianna. We do see Loker getting ready for a gank, but he doesn't try for anything yet. Just making sure that Karama doesn't get all in without help. But you'll look to see this Victor, you know, come online around a level 6-7 advantage. And we see Loker being extremely smart and man walrus with him too trying to make sure that hamlet doesn't get the early back just trying to help karama even more in his early game making sure he will leave and still have the same lane uh advantage as oriana just keeping oh. the lane even but we do see the all-in from hamlet finally command shockwave being used onto karama doesn't really get much but a little bit of utility provided on the side of hamlet right there ultimate is going to be down so loker could potentially um abuse that fact as Rexalus and Pokemon are going to be going back and forth. Rexalus is only at level 5 while Pokemon is level 6. Probably going to be level 5 soon. So not a big deal right there as uh, Pokemon clears out the, the ward in the top side. So currently still no first bloods. We are waiting for when the first blood comes in and um, when that starts potentially look for a potential snowball as the first blood starts. And if you're Ornhub, you're perfectly fine with Oriana drawing all of Loker's attention in the mid lane because you have two scaling side lanes who you don't want them to get any of that attention. You want Gangplank to, yes, he's losing to Rexalus a little bit in lane, but you want him to otherwise be able to scale passively in a lane. You want Twitch to get to level six and get to that, uh, whether he goes Infinity Edge, which I believe he's going to go ahead and rush first, um, get to that Infinity Edge without too much interference from Loker. And that's exactly what this early vision from Overrate, who that's his entire job as this game right now, early game, is to invade early and get early vision down. And also, that lane priority from Hamlet will do for you, as now Man Walrus and Shodenfu just getting back to lane, even in items, but down 11 CS to Asterisk, and that's perfectly fine for this Twitch. Well... I mean, both Twitch and uh, Shroyden, Fruits, Tristana, both of them are going to be late game carries. And I feel like just because of this meta, everyone has been picking these later, late stage game 80 carries. But Shroyden, Fruit really wanted to go on that Tristana. Hopefully will pop off. It is, it is uh, Tristana is 12 CS down right now. So not the biggest problem, but it is going to ramp up as we move on to the state, onto the later stage of the game. So hopefully Shroyden, Fruit is going to be able to pick up that CS. 
have that snowball back on his side and potentially carry out another game like last time. We do see pings going down on the middle lane. Zach can find a gank. We do see community going down as well. They're gonna look for this. They're gonna look for the team fight right there. That's gonna be the Hextech ultimatum going to be used onto this Orianna. Two man command shockwave and the cannon barrage as well. Coming in from Gangplank. Here comes Overrate on the uh, backside. That's gonna be first blood going out to Overrate. As we move on to bottom lane, that's gonna be another team fight as well. Both Karama and Loker are super low in that middle side. Looking back to the bottom lane with the direct to counter mode. Buster shot to try to knock out Jose Fumi. That's gonna be the headbutt. The pulverize actually, not the headbutt coming out yet. That's gonna be Jose Fumi with the headbutt. Gonna get taken down, a few more auto attacks might help him out. He, Shredder Food's gonna use the rocket jump to try to go in for more. He has to flash out of that one, and then Astris wants to go in for more. This might be a potential double kill coming out for Astris. Van Walsh has to flash away from this one as Astris is gonna be caught out by uh, Rick Solis on the backside. Jose Fumi's gonna eat him up and not spit him out as he gets taken down. Astris is gonna be on the invisibility. Here comes Rex Hollis to potentially go for more. Is he gonna able to take this one? That's gonna be a double kill going out to Rex Hollis. And at the end of the day, two for two on the whole map. So let's go ahead and rewind all the way back to that originally started. You saw Rex Alice getting too greedy trying to find that, that 3v1 dive. He followed the Hexec ultimatum all the way in. And then once he tried to break it, realizing, oh, wait, I'm too deep. Holy crap. All it took was an easy shockwave coming from Hamlet to secure that kill for Overrate after Overrate had to, you know, fly in. And then on the bottom side at the same time, recognizing the action the mid lane was going on and that shouldn't Freud and Manwalvers, they say, hey, we should have this 2v2 advantage with the Alistar Tristana. However, Tom Kinch, doing what Tom Kinch does, saves Asterisk multiple times and allows him to get great positioning to put down all of his damage. Shouldn't Freud jumping in, trying to find a kill, not taking into account, Asterisk still had his heal up and gets baited in and then just immediately goes down, sacrifices his lane advantage. However, the upside for the side of Vortex is that they did get a double kill onto Rex Alice. He didn't die again. So that will accelerate his build path toward the 20th force. You already see he has the Sheen and the Phage. So at least that accelerates his way to his split pushing potential. However, he did give the Gangplank a lot of time alone in the top lane. Gangplank did get an assist from that gank in the mid lane. And his Twitch is now well on his way. I believe he's going to go ahead and finish the Static Shiv first, or the Runan's Hurricane, I'm sorry. He is well on his way to beating oh. this Tristana in lane. Mid lane fight, Command Shock was going to be used at the Command Attack, takes him down. Loker and Rexalis are going to be coming in, heal to try to speed him up, but that's going to be the Hextech Ultimatum used on the side of Rexalis. Hammond's going to be trying his best to dodge him, dip out <laughs> and dive out. Cannon Barrage as well to come out. Overraid's going to be coming in, and that's going to be Loker on the passive with the Zac right here. And this is looking really, really good as Rexalis takes up another kill. Manwalers headbutts. Pulverize Jose Fumi into the tower range. Stunned up right there in Rex Solis. Looks like he might be here for another kill. And Rex Solis is on a rampage as he's currently 4 1 0. So, once again, they try this three man dive on top of this Orion, recognizing they had to shut down Hamlet this game. However, he's already a one kill Oriana, and he already has Seer of the Goddess. Now he has his Archangel staff in that fight. And I have to assume that, yes, the changes did come through for Tier of the Gods and Archangels because before you weren't seeing the Orianna build this item. And so it's already a one item up Orianna. She just completely begins to delete Karam before help can even arrive and gets the kill and is able to even escape once help arrives because all these globals coming in for the side of Ornhub just ensures the safety of any laner that might get ganked. You saw the Gangplank Ultimate coming in for damage. You saw Tom Kinch finding his way to the mid lane using his Abyssal Voyage to try and save Hamlet's life. We'll see another gank come in, possibly from the Zac right here. Loker is going to be trying to go in and it gets eaten up. Hamlet is going to use the two-man command shockwave. Here comes over it to help out the team. Karama is going to be trying to escape command attack to slow down Karama, but they are going to escape out of this one. And like both teams are meeting up with their junglers. Nice ganks, but a nice counter gank coming outside from Overrate as well. And Hamlet can't find a break. He, fortunately for him, he's so far ahead that he doesn't need a break because anytime they try and gank him, he just takes them both to half health and then lines up a possible kill with Command Shockwave. But you see how much priority that Vortex put on his mid lane. However, it is to their detriment as their side lanes are slowly beginning to fall behind. You still see this Twitch. 
he doesn't have a CS lead, but he's still at a comfortable place in this game. Gang playing, getting a lot of free farm on the top side. And I like to see the proactivity from the side of Vortex. However, I just think it's misplaced now that Karama is this far behind in lane. You, you can't keep going this way. However, Pokimane getting in a 1v1 with Rexalis. Wow, another kill in the mid lane and uh, Hamlet pulling it out. And Rexalis is another kill, 5-1-0. 100% of the kills have gone to Rexalis currently, so Rexalis, uh, look at him to potentially carry out his team to have uh, some crazy plays in the later stage of the game. And they're putting all their eggs into Rexalis's basket. This is turning from uh, uh, Camille, whose priority would possibly be to, you know, help with team fights, isolating targets. Now, she's going to be on the split push most of the time because they recognize, hey, this Orion is going to be so powerful later in these team fights. It's going to be hard to, to, you know, turn a team fight in our favor. We're going to need this Camille to try and split push, however, Astra's getting engaged on. Well, you know, as uh, Tom Kench, if you get engaged on, you just eat him up and spit him out, and that's about it. So that's, yep. uh, you end off the, the engage right there. That's the annoying part of uh, Jose Fumi's Tom Kench. If someone tries to go on you, especially if it's an Alistar, but it looks like a red buff fight is going to be right here. Cannon Barrage is going to land onto all three members, actually, as Overrate is going to be jumping onto Karama. He's a little far ahead. Oh Jose God, Fumi tries to come and eat him up, but he spits him back right out to safety right there as Rexalis is going to be on the backside. Is he going to be able to pick up another kill? Rexalis right here. Going to try his best. Loker slays out Hamlet right here. Unstoppable is going to be. Loker, are they going to be able to get any more? Man, Walrus gets slowed by the stun, and Overrate finally picks up a kill for his team right here, and that is a two-for-one on the side of Ornhub 2.0 and that fight was just all about Ornhub 2.0's global you know this is a, the, just like the first game it's a game where they try and find his advantage by all means they should win that fight in the jungle when isolate trying to take red buffs around by three people but the gameplay ultimate comes through as well as his TP you see the Oriana able to roam quickly to the fight and you see Tom Kinch with the Abyss of Voyage bringing Twitch with him and we do see Loker trying to find an engage on this Tom Kinch with a TP from Rexalis. Yeah, Rexalis is going to be on the backside. Looks like the Hextech Ultimatum is going to be on as well. It's going to get... Stress and Jose Fumi are going to be trying their best, but Rexalis does so much damage. 2v1 takes up a kill. Rexalis is going to be next as well to get taken down. Pokimane might get him down. That kill is going to land on to the shutdown of Pokimane, but a really nice job on the side of Hub 2.0 to try to lead their team to victory. And... While it's great that Rixalis is, once again, it's great he's getting all these kills. However, you're putting all your gold into one person who, once they get shut down in a fight, you know, your fight's basically over. If he can't find a way to shut down Astros oh. and or Hamlet first. Oh, wow. Well, Command Shockwave takes out another kill right there. And Karama, 30-second death timer for him as Warnhub 2.0 right here are uh, doing a little better than their second game. Oh, yeah. I mean, head head over heels better. And it's just, they love to play these global advantages. And on that one, it wasn't even really global. Actually, back in again. Another team fight coming in. Hamlet does not have the command shock with up yet. Does use the command attack and the command dissonance to try to slow them down. But Hamlet is just going to run away with his team. Jose Fumi's with him as well. No kills actually in that little skirmish right there. But uh, a nice try for uh, Ornhub 2.0 to try to make something happen again. As Hamlet picks up this blue buff for himself for the mana region. And once again, another engage foiled by Tom Kinch. Jose Fumi has been extremely clutch in saving key members in these fights making sure these engages from the side of vortex are just nullified being able to eat up any care that gets taken and by all means hamlet and asterisk probably should have died one or two more times in this game but because it's tom kinch just being able to abyss avoid his way into fights and eat up key targets vortex can't find the priority and therefore can't find the kills and it's something that's been plaguing Vortex this entire series, giving Ornhub these champions that allowed them to play aggressive and even at some times, you know, a bit greedy, but still able to survive because they have the globals on their side. And now you have a Shivana who's 6 1 and 1 has a Frozen Mallet and Blood Razor. Gangplank just hit his Trinity Force spike. And Twitch will probably soon have his own spike as Rexal is actually getting engaged on by Overrate. Yeah, Cannon Barrage has to be used right there, but they don't really get a kill. They just want to knock him out so that they can potentially push down this tower, but Loker is on the tri-brush area to try to stop anything that happens. 
Let's see if they're going to be able to take down this tower. Actually, Rexolus stays as well. Here it comes in Engage. That's going to be three of them. Hextech Ultimatum down as well. Loker and Squad are going to be trying to go for more. Pokimane is trying to run away. Rexolus is low as well. Is he going to be able to stun someone up? That's going to be a stun onto over it. And that's going to be them going on to Loker as well. Loker is going to get taken down. He does, he does have his passive up. But at the end of the day, that's going to be a two kills for the side of Hornhub 2.0. And, oh, we have another fight in the bottom lane. Another fight in this bottom lane. That's going to be the pray and, spray and pray. Going to use on Shroyd and Fruit as well. Jose Fumi misses his tongue lash. Man Walrus might be in a bit of trouble. Gets slowed down, but they don't go for any more Pokemon. Topside just going to clear down this control ward. And a lot of fights, but we're over now. Right. And in the top lane, while it's great that you saved turret, you also just gave over two kills, you know, for the price of one. Yeah, and you saw the problem, the innate flaw in the way that Vortex has played this game just because, yes, Rexhouse can get the initial burst kill onto Hamlet for a one-off, but then once he's done with that, Pokimane is now a big enough gangplank to where he has sustain from just scurvy and all, just the sustain plus damage to immediately win a team fight and turn around after that. And once that's done... It was Loker all left by himself in the top lane. He gets taken out. And yeah, you say the turret, but you give more kills and gold over to the Shivana and Gangplank. You just want to get bigger and bigger. And the bottom side, it was just a little bit of, you know, Ornhub flexing their muscles saying, hey, we own this lane. Get out of it so we can take this turret. And that's exactly what they did is just take the turret. So now it's a about 5.2K gold lead for the side of Ornhub 2.0. And that's a big gold lead to try to push themselves forward. Currently overrate 7, 1, and 2. He's just so far ahead. And all three of these games, even though he lost in game 2, he still did really well. As there's going to be another fight. Two-man command shockwave is going to land onto Man Walrus and Rexalis as well. And it looks like Loker and his team are going to back him up. But the whole squad is here. So if they do have a fight, it is going to be a pretty... Accurate four on four right here, but they do look like they want to disengage as they're just gonna dance around Put some vision down and uh, try to maybe not go in Yep, and we actually man while we're engaging on a hamlet. He might go down for Looks like they are actually gonna have a fight at the end of the day. That's gonna be the last bounds going in from Loker and that's gonna be three people getting knocked up. Loker is gonna be at about half HP right here As the Rift Herald is just punishing this bottom lane, so it's actually I think it's quite fine that they actually oh have this my fight, God, and Overrain is just gonna get down this kill, pick himself for this one up, as Tristana in a bit of trouble. And here goes that 4-1 game that, you know, is Ornhub's bread and butter. Having at least one split pusher on the map, they decide to let it be over 8 this time instead of the Gangplank, and because of Tom Kinch, and his ability to disengage and also Hamlet's shockwave, which is two man command right shockwave while Loker jumps in for that one. Loker's trying his best to help out his team. A lot of ultimates are going to be down right now, and it looks like stunned up is going to be Hamlet on the backside. They tried their best, but that is all they can go for two man shockwave and nothing else. And at the same time, this is just playing in the Orn Hub's hands. You know, yes, the shockwave didn't turn anything, but it stalled. Vortex enough to allow Siobhan to push. She got that kill and the turret and was able to even push for the bottom lane inhib turret. And this is the game that Ornhub is just going to continue to play throughout this game. Push lanes 4 1, 1 3 1. They had to disengage in the peel to get away from almost any engage that Vortex has and still allow someone to push another lane. And it's going to be up to Vortex to choose one. You either try and kill the split pusher as fast as you can before the four can push something else. Or you go for the four, or hope for the numbers advantage, and just hope to dear God that this Shivana or this Gangplank doesn't take too many structures and objectives before you can respond to them. And it's a hard game to play, and it definitely doesn't put you in a good spot, especially since this Shivana is so good at taking a, uh, objectives extremely quickly. I mean, you saw how fast she took the Rift Herald. She takes dragons extremely fast. She's getting that passive extra damage from having two dragons. I mean, Vortex is just in a really, really bad spot. Especially since there are so many members on the side of Ornhub that are hitting a power spike now. There's no one they can even really take advantage of. Maybe this Twitch, but he already has Infinity Edge. If he's saved and is allowed to survive in team fights, he's going to do big damage. This Orianna can just shockwave and continue to put out consistent damage throughout team fights. 
and the only single target elimination they have is Rexalos, and after that, nobody on Vortex's side can really kill anyone quick enough to turn team fights in their favor. And it looks like they're just gonna try to go for this mountain drink right here. They just take it down. And the lead is just getting pushed on and on more and more. They basically have every drink except for the Infernal. Three on their hand. A nice collective bargain, a nice uh a nice handful of everything for the dragons right there. But right now, if you are actually Ornhub, I mean how do you want to close this game out as quickly as possible and as smoothly as possible? You just want to keep using the 4-1, maybe even a 1-3. Spread out Vortex, claim vision in their jungle, and then go for the Baron. And if you want, if you, you know, if you're really good at it, then you want to do it without even giving them a chance to contest by pushing in waves and forcing them either, hey, you lose objectives by contesting this Baron and lose waves and therefore gold to catch up or you just let us take it for free, or you bait the Baron, use the Baron to pull them into your team while lanes are pushing, take a team fight you can win, get a pick, and then either go for the Baron outright or take an objective. The game's in your hands. You can really choose either. You're going to see they're going to go for the option of just pushing down an objective while zoning out the rest of Vortex, and Jose Fume caught out. Jose Fume might be caught up, but that's going to be a nice... Uh... Ulti actually coming in from Overray. Looks like Jose Fumi has to use the shield to try to help himself out. Where's the command shockwave coming in? That's gonna be a two-man command shockwave on the side of Hamlet as well. That's gonna be Loker with the passive on. They're not gonna really be able to take him out, but they're trying to end him Ooh. out. Actually, they finally get him out. Double kill going on the side of Pokemane right there. And they do look like they want to push in for more, but it is only a two for one right now. Are they gonna rotate to something else? Potentially that Baron as Rex Solace and Man Walrus might get caught. There it is. Man Walrus might be caught out. He's going to use the Pulverize to try to slow him down, but he has to flash away from that one. And it looks like right now, right here, Ornhub 2.0 are just going to not go for the Baron. Potentially go for a Baron. They have, have them baited out. out. They're trying to bait it out. They're trying to bait it out. Here comes over it. Paul's going to try to jump out of this one, but that's it. They had to try and find that bait because although they did execute their plan and choked out Vortex's vision, then found a fight in their jungle baiting Baron, and forcing Vortex to think, we don't know if they're starting Baron out, we had to face check our jungle. Although that plan was executed, it's still a dangerous Baron to take when you have a Camille, Alistar, and Tristana in a pit. Because of Tristana's explosive charge, AoE damage, and Camille being able to burst out Asterisk with Alistar to help, you know, it's still extremely dangerous to try and take 3v5. However, once they see that Rex Alice and Schudenfreud back away, they're like, hey, this is free now. We have vision of them recalling. We should be able to take this fast and to, to, you know, take without any accrued damages. They do that. Free Baron over to the side of Ornhub 2.0. And now they just accelerated their win condition exponentially. Well, win conditions and this team, man. 16 to 9 right now. 48k gold to 39k gold lead 26 minutes into this game and the 10k gold lead on the side of Orange Hub 2.0 both all these games going back and forth first game going to Orange Hub 2.0 second game going decisively to Vortex and right now and it looks like it is swinging back into the favor of Orange Hub 2.0 Rexalis just going to be clearing out some vision for his team just a really good series overall both these teams having a great fight and whoever loses this game is it's not the end of the world because they had a great showing. Vortex had a great showing, and Ornhub had a great showing. So it's only it's only week one. They can still slowly come back. Meanwhile, there is going to be a fight, and that's going to be a nice two-man shockwave. Cannon Barrage is going to be on the backside as Jose Fumi gets taken down. That's going to be the teleport coming in as well. Overrate is going to be trying his best. Unstoppable is going to be Loker as he tries to bring Overrate back down. And Right here, Ornhub actually can't really pick themselves up a kill that gets people super low, but they can't close anything out. And Ornhub will still get this turret. And Jose Fume was cut out, pushing a little bit too aggressively by himself. He's still not that tanky of a support with this Tom Kinch. He only has the locket and the Knight's Vow. So not extremely tanky items, but Overrate getting all in by Rexalis. Overrate getting all in. That's going to be the Hextech Ultimatum as well. Is Overrate going to be able to this one he's trying his best he does have the flash up and he gets out but Rexalis uses the flash as well. They're going back and forth in a shutdown goes to Rexalis. And a little bit of greed right there from Overrate, just staying a little bit too long in the enemy jungle. 
and that's what's going to get Vortex back in this game. You saw a little bit of green from Jose Fumi in the mid lane, thinking he was unkillable because he had backup, and they were able to burst him down without a good enough response from the side of Ornhub to completely capitalize on. They did find the mid lane turret, and I believe they were able to find at least one kill, but at the same time, finding kills like these and getting them onto other members of the team is what's going to bring them back in this game. You did see Rex House get one more kill, but now that Tristan has two kills, she's completed her Infinity Edge, completed her Stack Shiv, just needs one more item to get, hit that three item spike that might afford them a team fight win. However, this Victor is finally just completing his first item while Oriana Hamlet has his Rabadon's Death Cap. And that's the big gold difference right now that's really killing Vortex is in the mid lane. Hamlet able to find so many key shock waves they're just half helding uh carries on the side of vortex and the way they find their way back into a key team fight is getting hamlet down first which they tried so many times but they're gonna have to do it successfully try and burst them completely down but right now it looks like owner trying to find a little bit of a uh, prey running through the, the the dark jungle right now on the red buff looks like they do want to jump onto overray right here he might be in a bit of trouble salty but uh oh animation stops him and brings him back that's not good for the side of uh, orn hub 2.0 just slowly losing their not their lead but just slowly losing out but they go for the mountain dragon and as well they're just gonna push down this bottom lane so uh, not a bad trade a dragon for if they get the tower oh yeah i mean this is the push that they wanted I, it, right now it's the fact that as we actually see jose fume Trying to, look, trying to zone out this victor from the fight. And now the response comes in. A three-man headbutt pulverize. Three-man headbutt pulverize and a zero-man shockwave on the side of Hamlet. That's a big deal, but they still get this inhibitor at the end of the day. So not the worst trade, but here comes Loker on the backside to be uh, able to sweep this up. That's a lot of CC, and that's a lot of deaths coming out on the side of Hornhub 2.0. Pokemane trying his best to live out of this one. That's a slow Pokemane coming in. Gonna get taken down soon, I think. Uh, a few more auto attacks, uh, yeah, five seconds today. maybe. There it is. The shutdown goes on the side of Rex Solace, but they do get the inhibitor, so is it really worth it? I think so. I think you'll take that trade. You got a dragon, so you took a dragon away from the Shivana. Also got gold from all the shutdowns that you just accrued in that team fight, and it looked like a worthy trade for the side of uh, Ornhub. You know, you lose overrate. She, he thought he could get away on the Shivana by, you know, getting out with the Dragon's Descent. However, the Hexec Ultimatum prevents you from running away. You can't run away from this Camille. And then they get collapsed on by the side of Vortex after, you know, just patience by Vortex, realizing, hey, wait for Loker to finish the Dragon and then collapse. And once we collapse, get the perfect engage. We can find the fight we want to. They're able to find the back line, keep Asterisk and Hamlet in one spot long enough to burst them down. And now this game just got a little bit closer. You know, yes, they're still down a significant amount of gold, almost 6,000 gold right now, but it could be a lot worse. And now this Tristana has hit her three item power spike. This Victor at least has his haunting guys and his upgraded Hextech core. Um, so he's getting closer to being that team fighting victor that does so much aoe damage that we know and love and now it's just once again about finding another key engage and they can actually turn this game around well that last team fight was a a start to potentially turn it around pokimane and uh squad are just gonna clear out this top side they should just let this bottom wave push out so it's not a bad uh, call for them to push out of this top lane right here Objectives are going to be up soon. Baron buff is going to be up in 40 seconds, so that could be a potential dance that they want. Overrate is going to be on the right side. I don't think they're going to dive this one, but they do have Rexalis clearing out this bottom side as Overrate. Overextends oh a little bit down. That's a three-man shock. With holy cow, they're going to try to go in for this one. Overrate We're is going to get taken boys. down, but that's going to be the cannon barrage as well. That's actually not looking good for uh, Ornhub 2.0 as Lord uh, as Loker tries to go in for more. That's a lot of damage. Loker might get taken down soon. Over it is dead, as you know. Here comes Short and Fruit to try his best. Loker gets taken down at the end of the day. And Rex Solace might be the next target. Shutdown's gonna go out for Astris. And Hamlet gets taken down. That's a double kill going in for Karama. And this is a crazy fight as uh, Vortex are sweeping them down. Astris gets taken down. He's gonna get eaten up. He's gonna get taken down. And that's an ace. That's an ace. 
for a vortex. And Rexalis going big in that fight, being able to put down so much damage. They're going to go for this bear now. This will get them the gold influx they needed. And this is second Baron, which means it gives them an accelerated um, way back into this game because a new change to Baron. And it was just a prolonged team fight. A lot of Ornhub's damage is a lot of one-off damage. You know, they don't have a lot of outside of Gangplank. Um, and possibly if you want to count Astrus's Twitch, once he pops ultimate, they don't have a lot of sustained damage. And they just allowed Rexalis to wreak havoc on their back line, take out so many targets on his own. He's 11, 3, and 8, completely carrying Vortex right now. And Shaden Fru was also allowed to live way too long, dealing so much DPS. Karama is finally online. He will be able to, he has completed his Saris Embrace. He should be able to go back and complete his Leandre's Torment on this recall. And then it's a completely new game right now as you have a four-item Tristana. I mean, this is just a new game. You might as well hit the reset button. Both these teams are even again. Both these teams are even basically almost close like you said. But this is how, this must be a great mental barrier for the side of Vortex. The fact that they won two team fights is just a great mental uh, aspect for them. As Hamlet might get caught out... Loker looks like he does potentially want to go in for more, but they just stop at the end of the day. But like I said, this is the this is what they want. Have this momentum swing back for you, even though you're still down in gold. It doesn't feel like it right now because you've been winning the last two team fights. As Loker is going to be jumping in to try to go for more. That's going to be two man knockoff. Cannon Barrage is going to be on the backside as well. That's going to be the unstoppable or the. Let's bounce, but Rexalis gets taken down. Hextech Ultimatum is going to be used. He gets taken down as well. Short Fruit has to use the Buster Shot onto Overrate as they Tom Ketch jumps in for more. Here comes the side of Ornhub 2.0 to try to do their best. Pokemane is going to get taken down low. The Locket of Iron Solari to put some shields on this team as a 1 for 0 currently on the side of Ornhub 2.0. Oh my god, he goes back in. Going back in for more Man Walrus, trying his best as Chalkwave is going to only land the reset. Gordon Frode is going in for more with the resets. Jose Fumi, uh, Overrate, and Astros are low right now. So Jose Fumi is going to get taken down right there. The shield is going to help him out for a little longer. And Overrate right here. What are you guys doing? Slowly throwing away their lead as Karama potentially picks up another kill. And there's going to be a killing spree for Karama. And now this is going to be a free Drake. Is it Elder? I don't, I don't, it is Elder Drake. This is going to be a free Elder Drake on there. So they're going to have Baron and Elder in a fight where you think that all is lost for Vortex. You think they just thrown away their lead because Rexalis goes too deep without backup. They smell blood in the water, but we're too aggressive for it. However, Loker with the ballsy call again. This Vortex team is just showing that they have guts because he goes back in less than half health, trying to find King Ages because Hamlet and Jose Fumi were pushing mid lane together unattended by the rest of their team they find the kills they find Ornhub too far spread out and now they have elder and baron coming back to push this gold lead went from 10,000 for Ornhub to now it's less than a 2,000 gold lead and you think the fight you think the game was reset before now vortex has the advantage in this fight they have all the momentum and Ornhub is on their heels and just this game right here has been going so back and forth but i mean vortex is not giving up at this point. so really a like, good job for them a lot of teams they kind of give up and they just play it out just to play it out but i mean vortex every second every chance they had they've been pushing in they've been playing aggressively they've been playing proactively and not letting ornhub 2.0 make those decisions they've been rotating better in the map and they've been just doing it really well as loker potentially wants to jump in for more they do have elder dragon so the burn is going to be on for them as well Exactly, and they just played patient. They didn't panic when they got behind. They realized, hey, we have a scaling Tristana and a scaling Camille who is already hitting power spikes because she was 8-3 and three by about the 25-minute mark. And all we had to do was wait. And as soon as Ornhub makes a bad move, they capitalize on it. And now they're pushing the, the bottom side of the map, trying to find an inhibitor of their own. And they can completely do it. There's not much that Ornhub can do. As you see, Loker going for the back line. Loker trying to go into Pokemon as well. Overrate is going to get eaten up by Jose Fumi. And a and a cannon barrage as well. This actually might be a decent team fight for the side of or uh, Ornhub 2.0. But, but the they're gonna take it down. Short and fruit is going off as well. Is he gonna be able to have the recess to try to go in for more? They're just gonna take down this inhibitor and potentially go for more kills. But they take this down. That is currently a 1 for 0 on the side. 
a Vortex. Nice try on the CC. They try their best, but they still can't make it happen on the side of Warren Hub 2.0. And something that plagued them in game two is plaguing them now, which target prioritization. Shaden Freud is going untouched in the back line, is able to pump out so much damage. This is a four item Tristana pumping out as much damage as she possibly can. Asterisk has to get saved from Loker. This is a really dangerous position, however, for the side of Vortex. They are all low. The Abyssal Voyage is up for the Tom Kinch, but I don't think they're going to try and find anything. Ornhub is just relieved to be able to kick Vortex out of their base. Well, another team fight win on the side of Vortex right here, and they momentum. I mean, if you just want to look at AD carries right here, Shoid and Fruit, 8 and 4 compared to Asterisk's 2 and 4. I mean, just the positioning and the. The, just the, the prowess that Shoyden Fruit is bringing in this game is really showing because he is carrying these fights a lot of times, putting them the damage in the backside. Hamlet landing some really good ultis every team fight. Also, that last team fight, a lot of good coordinated CC and also a lot of good coordinated ulties together, but they just couldn't put it together. Asterisk on the backside couldn't put down the damage. Shoyden Fruit is putting down the damage, and that's a big, big deal when you go into this late game. Just the 80 carries are so moment like they just put down s they have so much power and just this meta with late game 80 carries it's up to you to carry your team when it gets to these stages of the game and this is a tristana start off the game o2 and three and it's mainly because she like in these team fights now they were patient and now she has so much armor shards actually rexalis gets caught out Rexalis is gonna get caught out. The shockwave misses onto Rexalis, but Tom Catch is gonna oh. use the ulti. Jose Fumi is gonna be in the middle of all of them, and he might have regretted that ultimate. And he's uh, about a half HP as uh, Loker gonna be jumping out of that one. Jose Fumi gonna be using those honey fruits to heal himself back up. But I mean, 2k gold lead or about a 3k gold lead on the side of Vortex right now. So, I mean, real strong showing. And what a barren power play they just had. Like you said, they just flipped the goal lead about six, 7,000 gold into their favor. And this Tristana, like like you mentioned, is a big part of that. Shaden Fruit, he now has the armor shred that takes these tanks for the side of Ornhub out of the equation. Tom Kinch and Over8 can now no longer sit in the front line and just tank up damage from Shaden Fruit and Kurama because they just get torn apart by the Tristana. And then that allows Rexalis to find his way into the back line because when the tanks had to back away, so does... Actually, we see a fight go down. I had to stop Ooh, it is a little low. That's going to be the redemptions used to heal up the side of um, Vortex. Short and Fruit is on a killing spree right here. I mean, just right there, just not even contesting that Baron. They tried to, but they couldn't. Pokemon not in position right there. Just having Vortex out-rotate them in these fights, knowing exactly when these timers are up are helping out the side of Vortex heavily. They tried to contest and they lost Jose Fumi for it. And I mean, it's just such an impressive turnaround from the side of Vortex. They get that Baron. They don't even panic when they realize that Ornhub is trying to steal it. Now they're going to try and push for the base in the end of the game. This could be it. This could be it. That's going to be the cannon barrage used as well, man. Well try to get out of this. They, it is a five on four, but they do have two Nexus towers alive so it is going to be a lot of damage if they dive there that's going to be half hp for short and fruit only one command attack and a command dissonance that's a lot of damage still coming out on the side of hamlet so potentially they might want to back off of this one as jose fumi is going to be alive or will they try to fight it looks like they're probably just going to back off they do have baron buff so it is empowered recalls right now i believe yes, yes. hamlet has a lot of damage but now this tristan is at a point where she has blade of the room can just sustains she takes half health damage and she just goes and farms away because she's back at full health. And to be honest, unless they find a perfect engage on top of Kurama and mainly on top of Shaden Fruit, it looks really bleak from Orn for Ornhub. And it's even worse because Shaden Fruit has the rocket jump to get out of team fights. So it's really up to Hamlet to try and land a shockwave, try and interrupt the rocket jump from the side of Shaden Fruit. Otherwise, He's going to shred their tanks, giving Rexalis the opportunity to hop into the back line and just delete Asterisk and delete Pokemane on these carries, which is the point I was trying to make before the big Baron happened. But they just take another Baron, which is going to accelerate them even further because this Baron buff is now going to give them so much AP and AD, and that's a dead gangplanger.
Dead gangplank coming in. Hextech ultimatum is going to be used by taken down and these death timers are over 60 seconds right now so big deal they're gonna look like they're gonna take down this top lane tier 2 tower and I don't know how much longer Ornhub 2.0 can stand especially with Pokimane getting taken down with a 50 second death timer currently I mean they had to find a fight soon they had to find a miracle play soon whether it's overrate finding the back line himself or Hamilton ending a great shockwave a four-man shockwave because otherwise with these baron empowered minions after the new chain is only taking half the damage they did before as well as the boost but actually oh. this might be the engage to end it all Sonya's hourglass hamlet he looks like he's gonna flash out of that one but that looks like the shockwave is not out yet he doesn't really land it in there's Misses. finally the redemption and it that's not a good sign jose fumi's getting taken down super low as well he has a huge shield on him but look at this vortex has come back after a solid defeat in game one they're coming back in game two they've taken down the two nexus turrets over it's trying his best short of her just buster shots him out of there and he's just gonna take down this nexus and game three going out on the side of vortex good lord what a show of resilience from this vortex squad they get pummeled in game one win a close game two and then find the confidence from that game two to not it wasn't like they just steamrolled into game three they were down about seven thousand gold found a key engagement found a baron was able to scale up and then find the win and that's great for week one if you're vortex you solidify your standing as the one of the solid teams from last year show everyone that you still got it that you're not rusty get to knock off any rust you had before anyways and if you're the side of orn hub i mean that's a devastating first loss especially as a new team coming in but vortex i mean all that do they they stalled out long enough they were able to get this just on the four items and then once again shooting freud uh carried into the promised land but it was like the load was passed from Rexalus to Shaden for it because Rexalus got those early kills. It looked dicey. You know, you're wondering all this gold on this one carry member. How is he going to be able to use it to bring his team back from this deficit? And he just carried the load by stalling the game out by finding these essential kills to Shaden Freud, letting him scale up. And then eventually, this Tristan just took over the game. And this is the first week of Prophecy Cup, and we get a game like this, man. This is awesome. It is awesome. First week, like you said, a Prophecy Cup. Showing out why these best of threes are basically uh, doing well. I mean, just pretty pretty insane. And uh, culture, I'm just... Who, who, who would you like to bring in for this interview? I want to hear from... I want to hear from Rexalis. I, I want to hear from Rexalis. Because I want to hear, you know, his mindset. When you're sitting there, you're the one guy on the team who's doing well in this third game. And, and we have him here, Rick Solis. What's up? You grabbed the wrong guy. Oh, we did grab the wrong guy. <laughs> Come on, guys. Come on, Manny. <laughs> grab it in the wrong... Who... I don't even know who it is. Jesus. Oh, my goodness, man. Oh, wait. Hello? Still the wrong guy. Is this, this is the wrong person, I think. Who is this? I'm Karama, this the mid laner. Karama. Oh, dude, why don't we just... uh? I have no clue, man, Manny. <laughs> it's uh, it's Mitter, Mr. Diddles. Mr. Diddles. He wanted Diddles. ranks. Of course he is. Hello? What's up? Some technical Yo, what's good, dude? Yeah, what's yeah you guys couldn't figure me out, dude. It's all good, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. So, so, congratulations on the win? Yes, dude, I'm hype, dude. Oh my god, I'm hype. Oh, that reverse sweep, dude. I'm so hyped for this shit, dude. Yeah, I was Whoa. so fucking hyped. I can't even like, I can't even be like, oh my god, I was speechless after that fucking game. Bro, you probably have one of the strongest mentals I've seen. You know, I just want to like, tell me what you were thinking. You're like eight and three. The rest of your team is basically almost inting, and you're just sitting there like, I had to find a way to carry us to the promised land in this game three, a crucial game in week one. What were you thinking in that situation? All right, I'm not gonna lie. My team's a bunch of feeders. I'm the real carry. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like, like you, you, like they put me on a tank the first game. That's the reason why we lost. Um, but <laughs> when they put me on Nar, you know, I had a strong performance. Nar's like a bruiser. He's like my, he's sort of my signature pick. But then they put me on Camille, bro. 
I, I carried them through mid game and my ADC, you know, he hit the three item power spike and we were like, already, let's force these fights. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Uh, and we just snowballed the game throughout because their Oriana started like messing up her ults. Um, and they had a really bad like Baron bait instead of just doing Baron uh, during in the mid game when there were only two of us up too, which I believe they should have done that Baron. If they'd done that Baron, that could have swung the whole game around in their favor. But yeah, that's like my whole thought process through this was like because we did we we outscaled them and I was pretty confident in that and I kept reassuring my team with that. But yeah. I right, mean, I, I agree, dude. Uh, like, they, I agree with you on that point. They probably should have taken that Baron. But my next question is, with this big win, how big is this for you guys going into the week two against the Hashlinging Slashers, who right behind Orn Hub 2.0 were probably one of the more dominant teams in playing. So you guys got two tough games in a row. This has to be big for a mental going into week two and going into scrims as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty exciting because uh, this whole last week we were just like screaming and practicing like nonstop, 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 and it actually like really paid off. Um, some of the things that we worked on were really shown in this game, and our pick van was way stronger, uh, I believe this time around. Like I feel like every game we outdrafted them, uh, even though we didn't execute on our draft the first game, but I really do feel like we outdrafted them. I feel like our pick van stronger. Um, so we're going to keep working on other stuff in game to make sure that we secure wins for the other games as well. But for our mental, it's a really huge boost. Um, personally, my, myself, I'm not sure about my teammates, but I was a little bit shaky, uh, in my mindset on where we stand against the other teams, but now I'm really confident that we're definitely a top four, top three team. It's great to hear, man. That's it for my questions. Flash, do you have anything? Hey, yeah, I, all right. The big question is you carried them. How are you going to whip your team into shape and tell them to start carrying you? Listen, man. I don't, my, my, my ADC, dude, shot, sh I, don't, I don't even know what the frick to say his name, dude. But, <laughs> like, that man, like, he, he carries me, like, all the time. But this time it was my turn. But, like, I think that they need to, we literally just need to, like, calm down and just wait for him to hit his power spikes or whatever, and then I give the game to him. But, but, but before that, like, it's just all of me. You know, it, like, I'm not going to lie. I'm basically the star player, to be honest. Hey, but, like, what, uh, four, yeah, dude, you already know, bro. I mean, you already hey, know. You carry an early game and then pass it off to your ADC. That's the commendable thing to do. Look That's the top lane away, bro. The top you know, lane away. I, I respect you. You're just like, I'm going to do it for the team. That's that's what you're doing. <laughs> Give that Shastana the three item power spike. I really like actually how you gave the three item when added afterwards. But I mean, other than that, you've done a great job. Congratulations on this win. And I think you, you're going to do it for now. Prophecy Cup, day one culture. We've had some great okay. games today. Like, Oh, yeah. I don't think it can get any better than that. But I mean, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, if you haven't joined our Discord yet, scroll down. All the stuff are on the bottom. Mr. Diddles. Oh, well, I, don't even, yeah. I don't even know your name. What is your name? It was, it's, was it's, it's Rick Salas. It's Rick Salas. Rick Salas. I don't know why. I just forgot. But <laughs> it's all congratulations good. Congratulations on your win. Rex. Thank you. Rick Salas, congratulations. Rex. Top Rex. on the say, Prophecy Cup. Before yeah, you leave, up? tell your teammates from me, from Culture, tell them I told you to tell them to stop feeding and allow you to carry them. It's Bro, not even fair. You already know I'm about to do that, dude. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, you did that so you can just tell them. Well, oh, that's... No, dude. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you tell them? Did you tell them what you wanted? I, I didn't have time. I didn't have time. I was getting into it. I was getting into it. And now I'm taking out. <laughs> oh my god. Oh yeah, I just want to say one thing before. Um, my jungler told me not to be toxic, so I'm not. I'm gonna try and keep it a little bit clean, but. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I can stick it out right there. Well, there we go. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Scroll down for the link. Scroll down for the information of this uh, Discord community server. Server That does it for us today. I'm Flash. Join alongside Culture. Welcome to Prophecy Cup. That was a pretty great introduction to our community, but great to have you guys here. For more, stay tuned. Stick on. Check the Discord community for more games. Thanks so much, guys. Bye. Have a beautiful time.